Greetings from the Library of Faculty of Political Sciences, University of Sarajevo. Uh, greetings to your all citizens of Metaverse joining today with us uh, in the honor of the second in a row uh, year uh, conference, Information Literacy and Democracy, Perspectives of Media Information Literacy Education. Uh, my name is Emir Vajzovic, uh, together with uh, professors uh, Thomas Mandel and Mario Hibbert, who will be your hosts and moderators for today's conference. Uh, we had, this is the second day of the conference after yesterday's very successful workshop with librarians, an expert workshop on subject matter. Today we have the uh, opportunity to hear uh, very uh, interesting uh, speakers and their topics. Uh, I hope that we, we all share the, the excitement of having this uh, event today. And I will kindly ask Professor Mandel to tell us something more about IDEA and the uh, IDESA conference itself. Thomas? <coughs> Thank you very much, Emir. So warm welcome to everybody people in the room and also on the, you know, in the virtual space, as we have this hybrid event, we still get used to them. So welcome to everybody. Uh, well, IDESA, the name of IDESA is Information, Literacy and Democracy Perspectives on Media and Literacy Education. So already in the title perspectives, we see that we have very different views on this, uh, on the field of literacy and information literacy. And uh, we are a very interdisciplinary group. And this was the idea of ITESA from the beginning to really bring together the information science field, which is interested in information literacy and concepts and definitions of it. Especially now in the digital world, we see there's a lot of Changes will come to the, or the additions will come to the information literacy definitions and concepts. When we think about artificial intelligence tools, uh, we have to get competent to use them and to be uh, aware of their <coughs> um, effects and so on and so on. So this is getting more complex for all of us. So we have a very interdisciplinary uh, group in this uh, conference together, which I, I like very much. So we have the information science, we have Emir and uh, colleagues, Anel from political science, also from the University of Hildesheim. We integrate the political science department with Paul Schünemann. And uh, also we have um, educators, we have people from social sciences, so we can really bring together the interested parties. Yesterday we already saw the very successful uh, dissemination workshop, education workshop for uh, school librarians in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and there we see we really bring, or here the group at the uh, University of Sarajevo really brings this concept and the education to the level, to the ground, and uh, has an impact. So this is really great. And today we'll have more the uh, scientific discussion and what does it all mean. The overarching question is, as we see, how can we improve information literacy? There's no agreed concept. We constantly rework our ideas and try to get it better. On the other hand, we see this is obviously a long-term investment. Maybe we, we might not see immediately the effects of our work here, but we hope that in the future, maybe in the long future, if we invest in school librarians now, they invest in children and so on, we have uh, some time to wait. But I think it's worth it and it's important and we should move on with that. So before we move to the beginning of the conference and the first speakers, I would like to express my great thanks to Emir and Mario for really organizing this event. The hybrids event are quite difficult to organize and uh, ch technically challenging. And here I think it works perfectly and smoothly already last year and yesterday. So, uh, and today we have an excellent start. So thank you very much for this and for the whole team of uh, University of Sarajevo uh, who are present and are helping here. Uh, thanks very much and this uh, is going very well so far. This uh, small addition to this uh, sci scientific work here in information media literacy 
comes from a small project that we managed to uh, obtain together from the DAAD, the German Academic Exchange Service. So they are uh, funding our cooperation in this uh, area uh, and we can uh, have uh, as one of the outcomes this pro uh, uh, conference. Obviously, we also had other plans, and we had for two years now uh, funding from the DAD for student mobility to mutual for mutual visits. And uh, unfortunately, uh, due to the pandemic, we could not really use this money, and we still are here uh, without students. And the Sarajevo students from University of Sarajevo could not yet come to Hildesheim, so there is some uh, catch up. We hopefully will make some time. And it is my uh, great pleasure to also announce that uh, the DAD will again fund this uh, project next year with the same amount. So we still have a chance to maybe <laughs> have a visits together with uh, students back and forth. And we have an opportunity to uh, again organize a conference in this mode or another mode. We will see how we do it. So we look forward to the next year as well, but for now we look forward to the presentations and the scientific work and to the discussions with the audience online and here in the room. So I'm um, very excited and uh, looking forward to this great conference. So thank you very much for the moment and I pass on to Mario. Please, Mario. <coughs> thank you, Thomas. Uh, greetings to all. I'm very pleased uh, that we uh, have a chance to work together with uh, Professor Mandel and uh, closely <coughs> cooperate with the University of Hildersheim in uh, uh, Information Literacy and Democracy Conference. Uh, my name is Mario Hibert. I come from the Faculty of Philosophy, Department of uh, Comparative Literature and Information Sciences. And last uh, four years, I closely work with Professor Weizovich from Faculty of Political Sciences, uh, and we <coughs> work uh, at the Institute of Social Research here in Sarajevo, uh, University of Sarajevo. Uh, actually uh, on research and development of uh, media and information literacy concept trying to uh, bring it uh, to the uh, curriculum uh, in Canton Sarajevo. So uh, our first uh, uh, speaker is our friend and uh, 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 it's my pleasure to uh, greet Professor Sračko Jelušić who is going to present uh, and comment uh, uh, and uh, explain uh, some of our concepts that we have been developing lately uh, and public uh, and that culminated with a, with a book media information literacy curriculum uh, designed for the digital age so uh, uh, I'll uh, make a brief note uh, uh, from the uh, Professor Jelušić uh, biography. Sračko Jelušić was during his professional career journalist for, uh, for Zagreb Television and Radio Rijeka, manager of the Rijeka Publishing House, director of the University Library in Rijeka, director and editor-in-chief of Benja Publishing, professor at the University of Osijek, and finally professor at the University of Zadar from 2005 to 2015. He retired in 2015 as a full professor at the Department of Information Sciences at the University of Zadar. As a guest professor, Jelušić was engaged at the University of Boros, Sweden, and the University of Graz. He was also vice rector for international relations at the University of Zadar from 2005 to 2010. Uh, he's the author of three books, Structure and Organization of Library Systems, a librarian's guide, how to publish, and essays on publishing. He was the president of Croatian Library Association and Croatian Independent Publishers. Professor Jaroslic, the floor is yours. Thank you. I thank you kindly for this uh, invitation. And uh, I must say at the beginning that I received uh, this book that is in front of us as a present from uh, colleagues Emil and Mario. And, uh, which was a pleasant work. Uh, the book mainly consists of uh, two parts. The first one is uh, theoretical, and the second part uh, consists of uh, curriculum. Of course, I will uh, not talk about this book, 
all the time because while uh, I was reading it and I must say I read it in, in only two days because it was really interesting uh, but I will say uh, how it steered my mind because uh, it has many elements that uh, took me back to the years when I was teaching but especially I was pleasant surprised that uh, the foundations for the work uh, that they are explaining and building the curricula on in these books uh, were based on the authors I will talk a bit later about that I frequently used in my teaching and uh, obliged my students to read. So uh, I met some authors uh, in this book uh, that were cited that I thought were already forgotten, but uh, when you get deep in the works they were doing, you see how still alive uh, these um, thoughts that were not made only on, on data, just late, lately. Uh, people that deal with social problems uh, base their findings on data, but before data were not accessible and they were thinking deeply about society. And this is what they pulled out. So that was uh, exciting, uh, brought me back to the time when I was teaching, but also made me think wh what is the next step, because as we saw yesterday, uh, this uh, group of uh, people that is uh, thinking about uh, education in the digital age uh, is not doing a short-term uh, program, I think. It is working on the long-term and long-run complex problem of uh, solving uh, some most difficult situations in the society which are not only provoked uh, by uh, the new digital age and the new digital media but they take into consideration the very complex political situation in their society. So on one side we can say that uh, what uh, they were uh, writing about uh, in this book uh, are global and taking in the consideration the global surrounding, but on the other hand, uh, it's applicable in their own surrounding. So uh, I think this is a, a good formula for a success of the whole project. I can't see what other way or better way I can think of, a but can't think of a better way uh, how to continue this. So uh, these foundations were very interesting for me. The second point that was most interesting is that uh, they deeply uh, rely on libraries and uh, librarians. And I will, in the second part of this presentation, I will explain another uh, author who thinks the same uh, from another part uh, of the world, from the United States, but he also thinks that uh, these complex uh, uh, problems that are arising from the digital surrounding uh, can be solved and must be solved uh, within the library environment. Of course, uh, the most important uh, subjects here, the most important professionals here, in his view also, are the librarians. And as we saw yesterday, this room was full of librarians who understood what is going on and are ready to help to solve this uh, situation. So this is what I will talk about at the beginning still regarding the book I want to stress
another one. Okay. Uh, there are many topics in the book, but uh, uh, what I want to stress here is the ethical part uh, that takes uh, quite a lot of uh, space. Uh, and this book deals with several important issues of information and media literacy, but uh, I decided uh, to stress the ethical part because somehow um, I had the impression that not explicitly, but especially within the lines of the book, uh, you could see that the authors are concerned with, with this aspect. I was pleased to see that uh, they relied uh, um, very um, trustworthily to the works of uh, our colleague who is in Germany, Rafael Capuro, and uh, they dealt with these uh, problems in the theoretical part of uh, the book. Um, and in the co conclusion of this uh, uh, talk about the ethics, is stressed that libraries and librarians are the pillars of support in every egalitarian and ethical society. So. Uh, I want to stress this because I think globally, but especially in this surrounding, ethical questions are very important. Uh, uh, in this part about the ethics, uh, the book emphasizes the necessity to bridge the ever-present social gaps, and they does it work? No. Yeah, this is it. Uh, it for me, it was interesting that uh, UNESCO is uh, included in this uh, whole project, and uh, this from my point of view, may call for the need for a supranational and primarily cultural association in order to at least partially rectify the lack of success caused by the inactivity of domestic and foreign politicians. This, when I say this, I mean that maybe this is the way to bypass the mistakes that were made uh, in the past. And uh, it's the invitation to the transformation of society and of the media and information space based upon planning and ethics. Uh, we must be aware, and I want to stress this at the end, that the present network and digital space is programmed and produced. It's not something that comes down from uh, heavens. And uh, most of us think that is producing un unwished effects. It points out to its possible transformation solution in order to make it useful for all the citizens. And this is the uh, this ethical part that is uh, important and is stressed in the book. I will not deal with other questions that are exposed in the first part of the book because this ethical part somehow emerges as the most uh, important. Uh, I want to try pass here or here. OK. Uh, I will briefly tell you uh, about the authors that were the base for this uh, theoretical part uh, of the book. The names that are written in red were my um, 
uh, story. The names that are written in, written in red are mentioned in the book. The ones with the black letters is my addition. I went a bit back in the history, more farther back than the author started, and uh, I mentioned here Gutenberg and his movable type, which was later analyzed by Elizabeth Eisenstein talking about the printing press as the agent of social change. So if we make a parallel with what is going today with the media, and we think of, of, of what uh, Elizabeth Eisenstein said, that the printing press was the agent of social change, uh, taking into account that the media today present everywhere and the pre printing press was not, we can say that uh, uh, the same applies to the media today. The authors mentioned Max Weber, which I was pleased to read because Max Weber explained how capitalism is working. And we in sociology think today that uh, he laid the foundations of understanding capitalism as it is today. The one uh, who made the revolution in thinking about uh, media was Marshall McLuhan. And uh, I was always thinking when I was teaching to the students, well, should I give them McLuhan? Or is it already too old and forgotten? And is it uh, complex? Because, you know, when you look at his uh, books, they are already like uh, the web. And then the metaphors he used uh, Mm, were hard to understand. But when we think today and we look at everybody of us and see that probably there is no person in this room without a mobile phone, and when we think that McLuhan said that uh, the media are our extension, then even today after, that was in the 60s, after 40 years, his metaphor that was hard to understand today is more live than it was uh, ever before. before. So uh, he was first to talk about the role of media. Of course, it was only the television there. It's very wise that the authors are relying also on what uh, McLuhan was uh, saying and doing. Another guy who is extremely attractive in his thoughts and was not uh, relying on data but was only thinking is Jacques Le Goff, who wrote about how we develop science today and how the university was developed. In fact, he is talking about the Renaissance in the 70s. He is talking, you see, after the name of the author, I put the years of birth and death. And after the title of the book, I put uh, in the, uh, the, the year when their, their works were published so that we can make a comparison. But the first one who relayed on data, and I'm saying this because I think in, in, in the next steps of your huge and demanding projects, you should also start gathering data and make conclusions and future projects based on that data. And the first among these authors mentioned here, who strongly relied on data was Castells. And you are using him too. And I think there's very few thinkers that uh, predicted the influence of the media 
to the society in general. And uh, if you want to go deeply and understand him, it's not to enough to read only his book, but it's very necessary to listen to his lectures. You can get them on the uh, YouTube, and uh, yesterday we, we, we heard uh, a lecture how we can browse and, and select the content on, on YouTube. Uh, this is fascinating, how, how he's uh, talking and explaining uh, deeply uh, what he's thinking about the influence of uh, the new media. So uh, there's two more authors I want to mention, uh, who is the, in the 90s, Rafael Capuro, who is central here for these ethical questions I was uh, talking about, and in the second part of uh, my presentation, I will present you, which is also accessible on the YouTube, what our friend and colleague Nicholas Belkin from Radgers uh, lectured on in, in uh, April, I think, this year, on the LIDA conference, and his lecture was called ubiquity of uh, information. And again, here we find uh, a researcher, a scientist, who was able to name something, because there's a major difference between researchers who talk about something and explain, but the main problem is to name something so that we can understand all the implications of a certain process. So Nick, the present situation named ubiquity of information. And you will see how he put uh, in charge to libraries and librarians how to deal with this uh, situation. So. Here is another slide, uh, which is such a summary of these theoretical, theoretical foundations I was talking about. But uh, if you want to see the, the whole of what is going on, then you cannot analyze only what is going on today. You must see the roots, how all this was uh, developed. So you have here on this slide, you have the names, and you have this, the centuries to see how all this was uh, developed. I put uh, the authors of uh, uh, this book almost at the end, and at the end I put Belkin because I think we can learn a lot from his thinking about what to do next. And I think today is already time to think what to do next. Uh, in my summary, I said I would uh, talk a bit about my own experience uh, regarding this uh, question, but I will not uh, have uh, take a long time to do this. Uh, but the point, and I will not go all these uh, lines that are on the slide, you can see them, but the, I just want to say that the point of uh, listing these activities that were done, let's say, from year 2000 till uh, recently, and some of them uh, even today, is to show the complexity and uh, how wide you have to go in order to see what is going to work, how you will include the students. And this is 
right um, was Thomas expressed uh, his uh, his sorry that students could not attend because uh, it is our experience that including students in all the aspects of uh, educational uh, process gives uh, extremely good results. This uh, enables you to Uh, I will skip this one. Uh, it's an amazing world that is opening uh, once you include uh, the students. You can analyze their uh, uh, reading habits. We were in a situation where we developed uh, two departments uh, in Osijek and in Zadar that we had to deal with post-war traumas within the student uh, population, which I think it's not very different from your situation here. You can get to know the ideological and nationalistic prejudices that are among them, but what is most important uh, it's that you get to know them and you can identify the future leaders and maybe your future successors. Most of the younger colleagues that take part uh, also in this uh, conference and in the projects that were mentioned were our ex students and by including them in various uh, projects and uh, situation we were able to identify the ones that uh, could take on later. There is no guarantee that uh, you will not make a mistake and we know it from our own, own experience but we also don't know any other way uh, how uh, to do it. So, in a way, I think I have some 10 minutes left. left. Uh, this is, I was looking, when I read this book, first I was, uh, since I was part of my working life, a publisher, then I'm quite picky and I always look how the book is produced and I was pleased that uh, this book meets the highest professional standards completely. But at the same time, looking at the content, I thought, well, what should they do next? Because here's what they're doing now and time is passing by they will have to do something else. And what is, I think, good and surprising, and it's quite rare also in, um, in our country, uh, cooperation and teamwork, so hard to achieve. So when you read this book and you see that it is a result of a group of authors and a result of a teamwork and institutional cooperation of uh, several faculties, that's another, I think, big achievement of the book. And uh, I think it's as important as the content because uh, it doesn't stay only within the environment of the ones that we're doing but it's spreading around. Ideas are spreading uh, around. And then I started looking. Uh, I took uh, several books of uh, Croatian sociologists doing, uh, dealing with the, the problems of uh, our society, and I couldn't find the answer. What could be a proposal for the future of this project and but i was as i was following uh, the lida conference 
I was listening to the lecture Nick Belkin gave and I was amazed because Belkin is deeply in the information science, in uh, information retrieval. And here we discover Belkin who is turning to libraries and librarians. For me, I, I couldn't believe it. And he also said some uh, sentences about uh, the LIDA conference and the uh, importance for the libraries in the digital age. This is the name of the conference. Mm, and I thought Nick was born in 1942, so he is almost 80. He, but he is still working hard. And I thought Nick is smart. It must be that what he's saying is uh, something that can be used. And he called his lection, uh, lecture extension of information literacy programs. So I thought this maybe could work for uh, the people here that uh, are trying to influence the changes in the society by changing what is going in a human mind. Because I always think that what we do is a result of what we think. So, if you have time, it's 44 minutes and 17 seconds that this uh, lecture is uh, long. It was a keynote lecture. You, have, you will probably publish these presentations. Look at it. It is um, very informative and I think it will be used for uh, what you are doing here. Briefly, what Nick said is that we now live in the information ubiquity. And what he is uh, worried about that uh, the informations that are pushed to us are much stronger and are taking the place to the informations that are pulled, meaning the ones that we want to find. And then he lists the positive and the negative aspects of the boat, which I now don't have time because I'm running now. But what is important, he thinks that libraries can assume responsibility for supporting people in navigating the sea of information through the design and operational tools which will support decision making, reduce choices, and so on. How? And this that is bold now is also, Nick is introducing a new concept. And it's not clear to me yet. We shall have to ask him, what does he really mean in application of this idea of radical personalization to support interaction with ubiquitous information. Radical personalization. And he thinks that libraries and librarians are up to this job. And then he says why libraries should do this. Because they understand people, do they? I think they do. Relationships among people, their, their goals and tasks. Sometimes today we see that some people are lost. They don't know how to continue. They provide support in a variety of ways. If you see contemporary and new public libraries and even university libraries, you cannot believe what is happening in the last uh, 20 years 
and, and, and the span of the uh, uh, activities uh, libraries do. And uh, I was pleased to see that he wrote and he said that libraries understand ethic issues. You see, I was looking for connections between this book is talking about and what Nick was talking, and I've seen a lot of connections. I, 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 I've seen that uh, the goal is the same. So, um, uh, and he also said how libraries can do it. He said, as educators, for example, the city library in Rijeka has more workshops every year than there are days in the year, over 400. As designers of a client-side personal assistant tool. This is something we will also have maybe the luck to hear from him what he really means. But by client-side, he means the content we see on the screen. So he puts in charge the librarians to design what we see on the screen. And if we remember what we said before, that the media, as um, McLuhan said, are the extension of us, then it is logic that this design is uh, critical. And that they could be so educators, designers, providers, and intermediaries. And extremely important, but I think this, uh, if uh, people who build the curricula uh, will take this into account, uh, then uh, this is very important for, for the ones that uh, will teach the future uh, students. Uh, he says, my time is out, he says, who? Libraries. He thinks that libraries are best suited for the production, application, and maintenance of client-side devices. So, uh, uh, this is a task that he gives to librarians. And again, in parallel with what you are doing, you chose in your project librarians to do this enormous job of uh, solving the crucial problems in the uh, society. And I have another minute. What could be done next, maybe if we ask Nick or if you uh, ask me, I would include in the future uh, program of your project uh, this uh, list of tasks that are uh, mentioned on this slide. What to do next and how. Service on the variet varieties of information. Imagine the sea of information, they are not the same. They are, they are all different. They in basic research into relationships among personal characteristics. I skipped the part where Nick was talking about the types of users, a whole variety. We, we treat users as a group, a monolith group. It's not. It's a huge variety, so a good research could uh, show this. And this already I mentioned, development of client-side applications, development of standards, very important, because then this could be used. If standards were not developed, we could not use computers today. Every one of us would have a different computer and they could not communicate and the communication is uh, basic. And the last, but the most important, serious consideration of whether personali personalized tools 
can be ethically responsible. So he comes back to the ethics. That this, this could be maybe an agenda for, good, for what could be done in the future. Thank you. Uh, our uh, sincere gratitude for Professor Jelšić uh, for his uh, expose and, and uh, detailed review of uh, our book. Um, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, these, these are the uh, next steps that we'll take into consideration uh, in, in following years. And uh, uh, we are uh, very lucky that our um, movement, which we like to call it on understanding and developing and integration of media and literacy is growing on daily basis, um, locally, regionally, and internationally. Uh, thereby, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, there are uh, enough energy to pursue future challenges and find uh, new solutions for the, uh, this information, media, and platform society that is changing rapidly every day. Uh, for some of the current uh, challenges, we have provided some of the solutions. So um, I have pleasure now to announce our de dear colleague uh, from Institute for Social Science Research, um, senior policy expert, uh, seasoned uh, practitioner in monitoring, evaluation, and learning, but also general secretary of the working group that was tasked with the drafting strategy for media information literacy in Canton Sarajevo. Sandel Huskic, please, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Emir, for kind words. And uh, I'm, uh, I perceive myself not to be a general secretary, but secretary general. But we can discuss that later. Uh, I have a great pleasure, actually, to talk about media and, and information literacy in, in, in terms that are used to, to solve things, as Emir said, the practical side. Emir and uh, other panelists will talk today about the theoretical concepts and, and what it means, uh, how we should approach uh, uh, thinking about media and information literacy. But I'm going to talk now about the praxis. Uh, and the uh, reason why I'm here today is to talk about the strategy uh, of media and information literacy in Canton Sarajevo. Uh, Emir, how do you change these slides here? Yes, yes. Brilliant. So prior, uh, prior to, to uh, talking to in detail about the process, I'm going to just uh, give a quick uh, overview of the main conclusions that can be drawn from the strategies. Uh, uh, the strategy will be very soon publicly available and you'll be able to read uh, the whole document. So basically the strategy is based on the hybrid model of multi-stage integration of media and information literacy in education and it is a concept that is being organically developed here in Bosnia and Herzegovina, actually within the group of the people that are actually, most of them are sitting right here. It is based on the concepts, uh, concepts of UNESCO. However, it is being uh, tweaked a little bit more, a little bit further in order to suit specific needs of our uh, localized needs. I mean needs in Bosnia and Herzegovina and probably in a wider region also. Uh, the libraries, as, our, uh, as my esteemed colleague uh, said, are the key, the core 
of the whole process of the integration of media and information literacy in education. What is important to note is that it, uh, the whole concept is, uh, is designed in such a way that the media and information literacy is not taught as a separate uh, subject. It is uh, not perceived to, to be something that's going to even further burden the students, the teachers, budgets, and so on. It is seen as the cross-curricular uh, competence and interprofessional cooperation uh, rather than being taught as an a, a individual separate subject. Also, the things that the strategy, the hybrid model actually uh, introduce is the digital, dynamic digital learning objects, open access to educational content, and guided inquiry learning. Uh, it is, uh, everything is intertwined and once you go into a document, you'll see that it makes perfect sense. Uh, also, the critical thinking is a very important uh, part of the strategy. And uh, what is very important that this strategy actually uh, means that the decision makers, the people that actually design the public policies that govern our very uh, everyday life actually recognize the media and information literacy as a key competence, which is a very important transition from the periods where they did not see the value in this concept. And also what is coming from the perspective of the social scientists, which I am for the past 15, 20 years, uh, the nice part about this strategy is that it actually introduces media and information literacy in the context of human rights. As it happens, we all come from the human rights backgrounds in our masters and previous degrees, and we were always guided by the concept of human rights, which is, they are saying the human rights age is declining, the new age is coming, but we are still keeping it there. And the strategy through its uh, goals and measures, actually perceives uh, access to internet as the human right, as essential as the first generation of human rights. So we are opening a new debate and discussion on the, the uh, key elements, what the human rights actually are. But I'll try now to uh, walk you quickly through the whole process. Uh, the whole thing started because once we were uh, acquainted with the uh, whole concept, uh, it made sense to us instantly. The media information literacy, if you think about it, covers pretty much everything that the uh, society and individual, each individual in society needs to have a, a fruitful and functioning life. And once we started uh, several years ago to, to actually actively uh, uh, read about it, think about it, talk about it, it made more sense to us. And we basically completely immersed ourselves in the whole concept and started actually trying to, to, to do as much with it as we can. And there is something wrong with this slide. Is it? Ah, oh, thank you. And we did quite a bit with it. Like once we discovered it, it was a new toy, you know, and uh, we just went nuts pretty much. It was beautiful. What uh, the team was composed of different uh, type. We come from human rights. That's our base. But our lives were kind of academic and professional led us in different directions. So we profiled ourselves, uh, ourselves in different uh, uh, different uh, disciplines, but once we started discussing, talking, producing things, our, our disciplines kind of uh, mashed, collided, uh, crumbled, and we kind of, what, what emerged was this antidisciplinary approach to actually working on uh, media and information literacy. So it's not uh, uh, discipline specific, it is uh, also, in a way, organic and antidisciplinary. 
So in 2018, we just, uh, 2017, we discovered the, the, uh, uh, the concept. 18, 19, and 20, we were doing different things from uh, exploring in, in, through research, also uh, venturing into uh, schools and trying to practically see if our concepts work or not work. We piloted in uh, numerous schools everything that we wrote on a paper, uh, we tested in the schools, and then we again adjusted what we thought we knew. So it was an uh, ever-evolving uh, 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 process, but it, it, at the end it resulted in publishing uh, quite a few books, position papers, assessments, uh, workshops, discussions, conferences, and so on. But this year it resulted in this strategy, and also what we did uh, in, in, in a process of doing these various things, we created, we are stumbled even, we can say, on the, the, the um, community of the librarians. Uh, because I'll let my colleagues talk about it in more detail. That is like our products are not just strategies and things. Our products are also the, the, the networks, the, the, the process itself is in, in a way a, a product. No. Okay. Uh, our partners uh, on our path are quite a few. Uh, pretty much all the institutions of uh, 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 all the ministries of education in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Quite a few agencies uh, also. Uh, we have a very close cooperation with uh, uh, more than once cooperation with several universities in, in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. I'm talking here only about domestic local partners. And yes, I said we were uh, cooperating, piloting, uh, working with in uh, uh, 40 elementary and high schools in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Also, I would like to mention step by step Media Center Sarajevo, a national and University Library of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Of course, there are UNESCO, IC, and the other agencies that actually help us in, in our work. But what I'm really uh, proud of is the, the fact that over 1,500 people actually uh, uh, worked on, on, uh, uh, on what we, everything that we produced. Now I'll go into the, uh, just mentioned the hybrid model of multi-stage uh, integration of media and information literacy. Uh, it is, uh, uh, basically it is an essential component for the individual uh, professional development. It's uh, something that we basically uh, realize very quickly that the, the, it is something that should be put as a backbone of the integration of media and information literacy in education systems. My colleagues Amir and, and uh, Mario will uh, tell much more about this later on. And here is the hybrid. It looks kind of as a very complex uh, model, but it, in essence, it is not. It is basically this wheel, but on the right-hand side are the specific small, minute cogs that actually make this model work. We did not let every, anything out. We introduced uh, new concepts, uh, tested concepts, so uh, everything that is in this uh, hybrid model has been tested. I know I'm running short on time. <laughs> it's uh, uh, also, it allows vertical and horizontal integration. Uh, Emir is going to talk about that much more. Uh, here is the list of the people that actually uh, worked on the strategy. It's not that many, uh, but uh, we were really dedicated on uh, developing this strategy. Uh, the, the point of uh, the strategy uh, was uh, not just making a strategy, it was a journey uh, that we did. Because it's, if you look at it from 2017, 
coming to 2001, it's a very uh, short time period to actually go from the idea and go to the praxis, to actually have uh, a serious policy implications on some administrative unit in anywhere. But uh, I think it's, it's a, a, a combination of luck, knowledge, and hard work. It's the it's lucky that uh, we come from different disciplines, uh, that we are also very interested in a topic, and that we are, I'll say, hardworking. But there are some other things that have to be accounted for. That is that uh, once we go out and, and preach the gospel, if you will, because people still don't know about much about media information literacy. Once we start talking about it, it makes perfect sense instantly. And that's why we had 1,500 people in the process, because you had to explain to every single person individually. That's one thing. The concept is good. We are hard working, yes. And the third thing is this, the uh, forceful uh, digitalization of everything, the pandemic. All of a sudden, this window of the opportunity, the policy window of opportunity opened instantly. And decision makers, they figured out, hey, we need this. So all of a sudden, we have the people that uh, three years ago did not want to spend too much time thinking about this to actually going like, oh, we need this. So it's a combination of the things that allowed us to put the, 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 our theoretical ideas and, and perspectives and, and calculations, if you will, into a, a practical tool such as, such as the strategy is. So I'll go, I'm not going to uh, go too much through the uh, specific parts of the strategy. It has very few goals, and they are quite clear, precise, and we made sure that they are not a mere wish list. We want them to be uh, achievable, sustainable, that they don't require too much funds to implement, we just wanted to have a, st a strategy with the maximum yield, uh, with the results that would not require long time to implement and uh, much funds uh, to implement. So the, basically the first goal is to implement the uh, hybrid, of course. Uh, the second goal is uh, to improve the potential of education, uh, educational institutions for male uh, teaching and the measures are quite clear how to do that. Uh, of course, we have to develop uh, new educational contents tools and uh, other things in order to, uh, for, a, uh, for a, a hybrid model to be absorbed. Uh, goal four, goal five, goal four, yes. Uh, the programs have to be adjusted for, for the uh, uh, development of media information literacy, uh, inf uh, information communication uh, uh, technology uh, capacities have to be improved. Basically, we can talk as much as we like about information literacy. The students still need computer and so on. Uh, yes. I'm reading this with my glasses. It's uh, life lo lifelong learning and adult education is a very important part of the strategy and it is well integrated through the uh, measures. And the final one is the, the final one is the reducing the digital gap. That's the, uh, the thing that I, talked earlier, which is related to the human rights, the right to information of every single individual. Uh, I can talk about this whole day, but uh, organizers, for some reason, gave me 15 <laughs> minutes to go through the whole strategy. Well, uh, that's, uh, In any case, thank you all for your attention, and... <laughs> thank you, Sanel. Um, we'll, we'll, once uh, we hopefully have this uh, strategy fully adopted and uh, action plan uh, that, that follow it, we'll probably have a three-day conference on just this part. So, so far, 
uh, idea was just to, to um, uh, introduce you the main concept that we have actually put into a policy document. It needs to be a step further from um, theoretical thinking, from uh, academic discourse into uh, something applicable uh, that will change uh, future lives and change the future of education. Uh, thank you, Sanel, uh, Professor Jelšić also for this uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I will kindly ca call for a, a nine minutes break now and we will continue uh, at 10.45 sharp with the next panel, which will be hosted by Professor Mandel. Thank you.
Ting. Trofa. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Welcome again after the break here now. We see people take a break here in the room and probably also in Facebook and in the uh, Zoom session. Thank you for coming back. Now we start with the next panel. It's my great pleasure to introduce the three speakers. We will start with the first talk or the three presentations. We have several speakers. We will start with a presentation by Professor Wolf Schünemann. Wolf Schünemann is a professor for political science at the University of Hildesheim, so we cooperate. He's an uh, assistant professor now, and he, before that he was uh, filling a, holding a postdoc position at the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Wolf Schünemann is working on digital regulation, so what laws are societies building up for regulating the digital sphere, large companies, contribution of uh, uh, users, and so on and so on, so EU governance, discourse uh, in the digital sphere, anything of, let's call it, digital politics, very simply. Uh, we recently uh, conducted a project together on hate speech regulation in, uh, uh, in Hildesheim. And also we see that with his vision in, uh, uh, on these innovative aspects in political science, he's very uh, successful. And we also introduced a new bachelor degree two years ago together that combines information science and political science that is called the digital social sciences. So that has also been quite uh, successful. And without further ado, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Wolf. And please, Wolf, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, you can share your video now. Okay, great. Great. I couldn't so far. So now you see me as well. Okay. Yeah, good, good to see you. Uh, I enjoyed listening to the first panel already, or the, the keynote, and then the introduction of the strategy. Um, yeah, I would have loved to come to Sarajevo, uh, but due to job obligations, I couldn't. In the end, I had to uh, give up the plans, uh, the travel plans to come to Sarajevo, which is a pity, of course. But now, actually, I'm feeling a bit sick, so it might have been a good decision in the end not, not to come. Um, so, yeah, uh, let me start with my presentation. I will share my screen in a second. Okay, now you should be able to see my slides. Yeah, again, uh, good morning. Uh, what I want to present to you today is on, on regulation and the disinformation dilemma, especially liberal democracies face when um, trying to regulate uh, digital media. And um, I want to start with some current trends. Um, let me just change quickly the presentation device here. Okay. Because otherwise I'm, I'm getting confused. I'm sorry. Now it should work again, yeah? Okay. As you might have observed already, there are currently many indications that uh, we witness, um, that indicate that we might witness some kind of uh, paradigm shift. Uh, Wolf, there's a, some audio problem with your microphone, please. Okay. What is the problem? Now it's good. Can you hear me again? It's, it's better now. Okay. I can try. Do you hear me? Yes, all good now. Okay, thank you. And again, there are currently many indications that we might win witness a paradigm shift in the governance of digitalization. This has to do with how uh, liberal democracies um, somehow yeah, um, distance themselves from the principle of abstention from regulatory measures in the field of uh, governing um, data economies, governing um, digital media, governing or regulating online content. Um, they, they 
tend to adapt their policies with uh, a view on the on the threat um, they see for uh, democracies um, emanating from digitalization. Uh, empirical studies have shown that also liberal democracies have increased their regulatory measures towards uh, the internet and online information and communication in recent years. This has been widely documented by uh, studies like the Freedom on the Net reports that are yearly published by um, or that are published by Freedom House on a yearly basis, and also by the transparency reports that are issued by the platforms themselves. They've shown that also liberal democracies are co-responsible for the global increases of online communication control and um, the decreases of internet freedom. Um, so why is that? I mean, I have um, yeah, here uh, exhibited or presented some examples. I mean, you've seen that um, we have in national legislation of Western democracies also seen um, regulatory innovations like the Netzwerk Durchsetzungsgesetz, you might have heard of it in Germany. Um, from 2018, it has been reformed in 2021, making it even more, even stricter. It is um, about enforcing um, regulation towards online content um, in Germany. Uh, the Network Enforcement Act, uh, shortly or abbreviated as NetzDG, has been criticized a lot uh, by international experts, but it has also attracted a lot of positive attention and has been emulated also by other countries, uh, national legislation, such as in France with the Loire Avia, at least initially it was pretty much oriented towards the German example, or also at the European level. If you look at the Digital Services Act that was proposed uh, in uh, December 2020 and is now um, <clears throat> under revision in the European Parliament and in the Council, uh, you see that it also contains some important provisions that remind us of uh, the Network Enforcement Act in the German case. So uh, given such trends, if you could add to this, I also uh, have shown you how, how the platforms acted towards uh, hate speech that was uh, and disinformation that was spread by Donald Trump, for instance, and you have, of course, the discussion on the Section 230 also and reforming it uh, the, the platform privilege also in the US context. So you see that um, there are many developments that uh, can be described as something like the end of internet exceptionalism. It has been described as such already years ago by experts, uh, for instance, in the US context. And uh, one could also say that there is at least an end to what could be said uh, or could be named as uh, the laissez-faire in internet regulation. But how can this major policy change be explained and which effects on international governance of digitalization can be expected? What does this mean for global and transnational data and information flows? These are admittedly huge uh, questions that I can only touch upon in this talk, but this is at least what I'm interested in. And I want to show that discourses of democratic sovereignty and the protection against threat for democracies somehow paradoxically play an important role in this development. And um, so today I want to concentrate on fighting disinformation, which is also, of course, related to uh, the topic of this conference, uh, conference information literacy. Uh, fighting disinformation as a more and more prevalent regulatory objective for liberal democratic governance of digitalization. So how will I proceed my, my argument? I will uh, present the research question to you and some um, basic propositions and basic thesis of, of what I would argue then I will briefly overview the state of research on online information control, and I will introduce uh, some kind of new type of uh, regulation at the theoretical level, which is an origin-based regulation of online information. And then I will show how some um, countries um, in their regulation somehow implement in practice this kind of origin-based online information. And then I will draw a conclusion. Let me start with the research question basic proposition. <clears throat> As you all know, for liberal democracies, uh, regulating media content is uh, far from trivial. trivial. Um, it constitutes a kind of dilemma, as I also uh, titled or chose as a title for this um, talk. Um, democracies, of course, regulate media content, 
they always have done so, but uh, they are always in the situation that Vic um, correctly describes in this quote, uh, when democratic countries regulate media content, they engage in a precarious balancing act. This means for the political practice that regulating media content, um, including online information and liberal democracies, is highly dependent on justification, even legitimation, political legitimation. And uh, in a number of comparative studies, <clears throat> together with colleagues, I investigated and I studied this kind of uh, legitimatory strategies, the discourses and practices uh, of content regulation and liberal democracy. For this presentation, I'd like to focus on the research question as written here on the slide, which role do discourses of democratic sovereignty play for the legitimation of online information control and liberal democracies, which new governance approaches can be observed. Um, yeah, I will give you already an indication on, on which turn the argumentation should take. Um, so this is my basic proposition or thesis for this talk. With the intensified threat perception with regard to foreign disinformation campaigns, the protection of democratic sovereignty has become a practical strategy for regulatory measures of online information control. This has caused, uh, somehow paradoxically, we might discuss later, an increase of regulatory activity at different levels, state and the media or civil society, and has improved the chances to gain societal acceptance. In effect, this might lead to restrictions of online information flows, especially cross-border, given the focus on origin-based um, regulation of online content. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. Let me give you a very short uh, overview uh, of some strands of the interdisciplinary research on online information control. I mean, as a political scientist, I look firstly at comparative government. Comparative government, um, the works there have mostly been focused on autocratic hybrid regimes and their control practices. It was all, always uh, an, ex yeah, an inclusive perspective on autocratic and hybrid regimes, as they were expected to um, implement restrictive uh, restrictions on online content, of course, for uh, different reasons that we cannot discuss here. There has been much less research activity with respect to democracies or cross regime type studies so far. There are, of course, a few, and uh, there is an interesting strand um, started maybe by Bush and others uh, who introduced some kind of inverted diffusion hypotheses. They argued already in the beginning of the years 2010 that um, democracies might even learn from autocracies when controlling uh, internet and online information which is an interesting uh, hypothesis and, and uh, interesting question that needs to be addressed by further research. Then in media research, you have, of course, uh, literature that has introduced this fundamental bias against control, uh, this normative um, that stands uh, against uh, media control by liberal democracies. But they have, of course, also shown researchers in this field that mass media always has been politically institutionalized, also in liberal democracies, and that a two-step or some kind of two-step or multiple-step institutionalization of um, media is even a typical mechanism that can be observed in media history and not something peculiar now in um, the developments in internet governance or governance of digitalization. And of course, they are uh, a younger <clears throat> or more recent strand is particularly interested in the content moderation that is exerted by the platforms directly. So not just looking at what states do and, and political um, decision makers do, but also on what the platforms do, how they regulate platform governance, algorithmic governance are the key words in this debate. And um, of course, we have to look at the co-regulatory measures of content regulation, but also the self-regulatory measures uh, with the community standards and so forth, and also reflect that they as well operate in some kind of shadow of hierarchy as they try to avoid even stricter regulation by political authorities uh, through their engagement in content moderation on their own sides and platforms. Then uh, an interesting strand uh, in the debate comes from international relations and security studies. Here, foreign disinformation campaigns have appeared in recent years as a much discussed uh, element of hybrid warfare with uh, especially liberal democratic um, countries somehow threatened in a more um, 
in a heavier way uh, through their bias against control or due to their bias against control, because this is more and more perceived as a disadvantage of democratic regimes and asymmetrical conflict constellations with autocracies and hybrid regimes. So their learning from autocracies becomes some kind of, um, of um, recommendation, even by realist scholars, for instance. Um, and uh, if you look at ins the institutionalist camp, you would rather see some kind of worries, concern of uh, destabilization of the liberal international information order, on the one hand, through the disinformation campaigns, yes, but on the other hand, also uh, through the self-undermining feedback effects, especially in liberal democracies that react to disinformation campaigns in these normatively paradox ways. Um, this is also an interesting strategy. And then you have, um, of course, a broader field of interdisciplinary research on the governance of digitalization, yeah, also dominated uh, at least for a certain period of time by uh, legal scholars that have uh, dealt with the role of the state and what state sovereignty might mean in so-called cyberspace for decades now. And uh, indeed, we see more a more recent trend in this field uh, of uh, discussing sovereignty concepts, digital and technological sovereignty, data sovereignty, or something you might be very familiar with is some kind of information sovereignty, which still has to be related to, I think, what information literacy is, or should be. But we can discuss this maybe later. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what I want to introduce now is some new kind of um, legitimatory strategy is the, and then practice is this origin-based regulation of online information. Let me start with a very fundamental typology developed by Cass Sunstein already in 1995. So this was not meant uh, towards um, um, theorizing digital media, digital speech, but democratic speech regulation as such in 1995. How can the regulation of speech information be democratically justified? This is this major question in his book, Democracy and the Problem of Free Speech, where he deals with this uh, fundamental dilemma or um, non-trivial task of regulating speech uh, for liberal democracies. And um, what I select from him is this uh, taxonomy or typology uh, of uh, justifications of regulation, which uh, is a uh, Trias here, which is a, a threefold. So it starts with a content neutral uh, approach, which is a bit, yeah, an oxymoron here, maybe, um, because how can content regulation or speech regulation be content neutral? It means that there might be a place or a space like a mall. This is his example where uh, giving a speech is um, prohibited as such. So you cannot do this. Uh, and this is independent of content. Um, if you want to find an example from the online world, you might think of unauthorized content production of a website uh, in the context of cybersecurity. It might be a website defacement, for instance. And then you have content based by viewpoint neutral uh, regulation, which is, of course, the standard, I'd say, in content regulation and also online content regulation and information regulation. It is, of course, based on content, but not on the viewpoint of the expressed speech or uh, the expressed uh, thoughts. So you would have pornography here, depiction of violence, online gambling, also hate speech. I mean, this is something we are working on together. Thomas has mentioned it. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and also extremist speech, but I put it in parenthesis because there is, of course, a gray area already to the last, uh, to the last uh, step, which is, or the last <clears throat> type, sorry. <clears throat> which is viewpoint-based regulation, where it is indeed based on content, but also on the express viewpoint, uh, where we clearly move towards with uh, regulating disinformation. Um, and it is interesting that, um, of course, neither uh, Kassansky nor I would argue uh, or say that, that this is problematic as such. Also, liberal democracies would uh, regulate based on, on uh, viewpoint, not only uh, on content. Um, Holocaust denial would be an example, um, or um, anti-Semitic statements and so forth, for good reasons. Yeah, But of course, um, giving the fundamental um, value 
of freedom of expression and freedom of information, this uh, last type is more complicated and difficult for democracies and it needs more, um, more reasoning and justification. What I find interesting with the view of the current development that there is indeed both in argumentation or in justification and in practice, some kind of a fourth type developing or appearing, which is original. It is not really on the content and based on the viewpoint, at least not only, but it is based on the alleged foreign origin of content or source and is related to this uh, threat perception of disinformation campaigns, that there are foreign actors that want to, um, to yeah, interfere with our publics and uh, thus, um, thus are active in some kind of disinformation campaign. And this is quite prominent in some examples that I want to show to you. If I have still time, I'm a bit uh, lost with regard to the time. Maybe the host can give me some indication how much time I still have also to uh, allow for some questions. I will just, you can write it maybe in the chat. I will just continue the presentation and then I read how much time I still have. So uh, when I give you examples, and now I want to give you examples, and I sh chose two examples, two that there is a mic open. Uh, we're saying we, you have to 10 more minutes. Okay, thank you. 10 more minutes is fine. <clears throat> so um, I selected two cases here, uh, both uh, liberal democracies, France and Australia, but both uh, liberal democracies that have nevertheless shown a more restrictive approach towards digital media and platforms in the recent years. Um, and so uh, might be interesting normative entrepreneurs, one might say, in liberal democratic regulation of online content. So um, the regulations that are central here are different in type. Uh, we find um, National Security Legislation Amendment Act from 2017 in Australia, which uh, where the basic regulatory objective is foreign espionage but is more and more related, there's a typo there, sorry for that, um, to disinformation campaigns, or its, its main target are disinformation campaigns. And this is a very um, interesting example because uh, this indeed has um, somehow appeared across the globe that we find this kind of fara like regulation. FARA is an abbreviation which stands for Foreign Agents Registration, Registration Act, which is a US law from 1938, which was originally meant against covered actions by foreign states and mostly on uh, secret services and foreign espionage and, and covered activities, but has more and more um, reformed, has put in place in a reformed way or has been established for the first time, also in liberal democracies, uh, and of course also in autocratic regimes to, and hybrid regimes to fight so-called disinformation, yeah? So um, this is an interesting development in recent years. You find far like regulations, of course, and in Russia and Hungary, and Hungary it was discussed in a very uh, controversial way throughout Europe also, because uh, European states and also European Union is still um, very, um, is still uh, against uh, far like regulations and is pretty much arguing against it. Um, but you have it in the US, it was reformed after the experiences in the Trump uh, election campaign uh, 2016 with the alleged interferences from the Russian um, government, and you have it uh, in, in the UK as well, uh, Faraday regulations, and in Australia. So, um, and then the other example would be France. France was the first country in the European context which adopted a law against disinformation concentrated on the period of election campaigns, uh, which is the so-called Roi and Fox from 2018. And when you look at the at how these, um, these um, legislations were justified, <clears throat> sorry that I did not uh, translate uh, the example here, um, the, the main um, the main discourse here, the main uh, narratives and frames is that indeed we see foreign powers with illiberal tendencies that threaten our democracy and we need to defend our democracy against these powers. And then the platforms are identified as co-responsible for undermining democracy 
and uh, thus need stricter regulation. Otherwise, uh, they would uh, continue serving as some kind of uh, accomplices of the foreign powers that seek to interfere with our democracies. Um, so you find these this dominant discourse and this legitimatory strategy. I give you the Australian example as it will be easier to uh, understand uh, and um, also understand the examples and the quotes. Uh, so I will read the quote by Malcolm Turnbull here from a speech introducing the National Security Legislation and, and uh, Bill. Um, <clears throat> Authoritarian states have been literally manufacturing public opinion in order to hijack political discourse and tilt the decision-making landscape to their advantage. These methodologies have been turbocharged by cyber. The very technology that was designed to bring us together, the internet, is being used as an instrument of division. Uh, end of quote. Uh, but at the end of the speech, um, he continues, we will not allow foreign states to use our freedoms to road freedom, our open democracies to subvert democracy, our laws to undermine the rule of law. And of course, this is a very um, good example for the logic that you also find in the argumentation of realist scholars, that it's indeed this bias against control in liberal democracies that weakens uh, democracies now in an asymmetric conflict constellation with autocratic governments using the internet, using digital media, digital information flows in order to threaten and uh, yeah, confuse democratic publics and um, democratic institutions. Okay, what um, can be drawn as a conclusion, a preliminary conclusion, of course, and I only gave you a few examples. You do not need to believe me. We can discuss it uh, if we have a, a few minutes left. But what is also from other studies and, and the work that we um, are currently doing are preliminary conclusions that I'd like to draw. First of all, what we see is that liberal democratic governments and other regulatory agents in democracies, platforms, for instance, tend to give up the principle of abstention from online information control. What we also see is some kind of securitization of these challenges to democracies. I mean, these challenges could be solved by other means than by security policy. So I think this is something we would agree on very quickly, uh, being together with information scientists, uh, thinking about the activities that might be um, exerted by librarians. Uh, I am quite confident that we would find other solutions. But the securitization of challenges to democracy caused by digitalization, and especially the protection of democratic sovereignty, serve as drivers for the change of prevalent legitimatory strategies in the way that I've uh, just uh, yeah, wanted to, to show to you. Uh, what I argue in, in another work on a more fundamental theoretical level is that we find structural and doctrinary nationalisms woven in um, these, um, into these legitimatory strategies that can explain new modes of governance and the respect of legitimatory strategies and have as effects and these are these kind of yeah, dilemmatic or normatively paradox effects restrictions of information and communication freedom at global scale, closures of national so-called information spaces through origin-based regulation of cross-border information flows, an encouragement of intermediaries for even more restrictive and much less transparent measures taken by themselves, but often under the shadow of hierarchy, as I've called it earlier, and then uh, an external validation of sovereign legitimatory strategies of honor control as practiced by authoritarian and hierarchy regimes, because they have argued in a sovereignist manner already decades ago, or two decades ago at least. And, and now also the democracies start, even though with a different democratic framing, um, and this might also some kind of validate the sovereignist legitimatory strategies at other places. Okay, this is it for the moment. I hope that there are still some minutes left for questions and discussion. Thanks for your attention. So uh, thank you all very much for your insightful uh, talk. Very nice. And I think it fits well into the program. We see uh, librarians, of course, we talk about them as providers of information, but also, on the other hand, they mm, can also be uh, sensors of information, right? And uh, we see this fine line that is there between the dilemma, what kind of 
uh, information should they uh, forward to the customers and the clients and uh, where is the, this information, do they recognize it and do they really cut it off. So I think this perspective is very useful and also from the regulation perspective. Okay, unfortunately due to time reasons, you made the perfect uh, uh, timing, So, uh, uh, but we have to move on and uh, go to the next talk. So thank you again. And we come to the next presentation by uh, colleagues from the University of Osijek in Croatia. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Miljana Michunovic. She was uh, and uh, Christina Feldvari. They both will uh, do this talk together. Uh, Miljana is uh, has studied information science in Osijek at the University of Osijek and uh, she's working a lot in the area of the effects of information technology on our daily life and on uh, problems of the interaction with human and technology. So this is, will be also very useful and um, Christina Feldvari studied uh, in information science uh, at the University of Zadar, obtained a PhD there. And she also works in the, she works in the area of the information uh, retrieval, seeking and cataloging, so also very relevant. And both are active in the uh, project DECRIS, which the uh, University of Osijek is leading at the moment in uh, Erasmus Plus project, where, they, where we analyze the effects of uh, the use and the problems of not using maybe open educational resources. So again, I think fits very well into our topic and please, Miljana, Christina, the floor is yours. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, you, you yes. do. Okay. Perfect. Welcome. Well, uh, Miljana will share the screen, I hope. Okay. Well, hello to everyone on my behalf and on behalf of my colleague Miljana Michunovic. As Thomas said, we both work at the Department of Information Science in Osijek, Croatia. And today we will talk about the open education resources and democratization of digital education in crisis situation. Well, the disruption brought by the COVID-19 crisis situation altered the educational landscape in ways that uh, challenged the existing higher education institutions, infrastructure, program, curricula, teaching and learning process and administration. Along with uh, these challenges, this pandemic also created an opportunity for higher education institutions to incorporate and make great use of digital education, open education resources and open education in general. Uh, the lockdown of uh, educational organization has already disrupted the educational on uh, all levels. And the UNESCO has stated that more than uh, one and a half billion students are affected by the educational disruption. Besides that, the current pandemic uh, may have a uh, long term results as the 1918 pandemic reduced education achievements in the adults who were born uh, during that crisis. The devastating impacts of this pandemic on education are undeniable and both governments and private sector have to increase their efforts to mitigate this impact, particularly through digital education and remote learning. Digital education refers to the innovative use of digital tools and technologies for teaching, learning and training, and it can take the form of either fully online or blended teaching and learning. And open education resources refer to digital and other materials used for teaching, learning, research, and training that are part of public domain or have been published under open license that provides uh, their uh, free and open use. Uh, the growing body of research, as well as different examples of case studies and best practices, suggest that there are great benefits and opportunities when using digital uh, education tools and open education resources in higher education, especially dur during a crisis uh, situation such as COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, these benefits apply to both uh, students and uh, teachers, uh, and in terms of cost effectiveness, the institutions themselves. In order to investigate the state of the play and of uh, the use of the digital education and open educational resources at uh, European higher education institutions, in the field of library and information sciences. Uh, during the pandemic, we conducted a questionnaire-based ex exploratory research aimed at the heads and directors of LIS schools and departments who could uh, provide us with uh, an insight into their institutional practices and policies. 
with the librarians and information sciences specialists be, uh, being one of the leading advocates of open educational resources we also uh, we were also interested to see how um, uh, how do uh, li schools and departments perceive and uh, adopt uh, the use of open educational resources as Mandel said, uh, our research is a part of uh, Erasmus Plus project, Digital Education for Crisis Situations, times when there is no alternative, whose aim is to create a framework for proper adoption of open educational resources and digital education in general and in crisis situations in particular. Well, the aim of the study was to identify state of the play regarding the implementation of digital education and open educational resources in the context of COVID-19 pandemic, specifically in the field of uh, library and information sciences. In addition, aims were to expand the uh, awareness of the role and importance of uh, open educational resources in higher education to stimulate the creation of uh, higher education policies and strategies that support development or, and use of open educational resources during crisis situation and in general, to stimulate the adoption of open educational resources in LIS subject areas in which they are most overlooked, uh, to gain insight into different ways for uh, enhancing and opportunities to create uh, higher quality open educational resources in place and areas that have already been used and the opportunities to increase their availability and contri to contribute to the future of higher education in crisis situation in uh, general. Um, before the survey uh, was designed, uh, an integrative literature, literature review was performed in order to advance the theoretical framework around the issues of uh, digital education and open educational resources and to build a firm theoretical foundation for our advancing knowledge on digital education and open educational resources in the context of crisis situation uh, like COVID-19 pandemic. The first part of the literature review uh, was related to seeking and reviewing distance learning instructions and recommendations for higher education institutions at the time of the COVID-19 pandemic given by the European Commission and the European Union. The second part of the literature review was focused on the critical approach and synthesis of the body of the knowledge on the digital education and open educational resources presented in the books uh, and uh, other uh, uh, reports and case studies on digital education, open educational uh, resources and open education in general. And the second method was a survey that was created using a Lyme survey. After the test phase, the survey was active from the June uh, the 1st till September the 1st, and it comprised of three set of questions, 38 questions in total, uh, referring to the issues of the implementation of digital education during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, uh, referring to the implementation and models of use of open educational resources during COVID-19 pandemic, and uh, referring to the institutional support provided to LIS schools and departments in regards to both both digital education and open educational uh, system during COVID-19 pandemic. As you can see, responses uh, were received from 56 LIS schools and departments for uh, 23 countries. And statistical analysis was performed with uh, our software and descriptive statistics was used uh, to quantitatively describe the data sets. Uh, now, uh, my colleague Miliana will tell you uh, about our result and results and key findings. Sorry, I just had to uh, stop the share screen. Uh, so I could turn my, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so I will go now to the results, some of the key findings and uh, maybe one part of the, the conclusion because our final report is actually about 80 pages long and uh, it will be published by the end of this year or by the beginning of the uh, next year. Uh, on our platform and the link will be provided by the end of the, uh, the lecture at the end of the presentation. So you will all be able to see uh, the complete results, uh, complete key findings and complete discussion and conclusion. And now, uh, of course, because of the time limit, we will just go through some of them, some of the most important ones. Uh, the results provided us with the uh, key insights and um, uh, understanding uh, of uh, digital, digital education aspects, tools, techniques, strategies that were used 
during the pandemic. Uh, also, what digital education resources were the most uh, used during the pandemic, but also we got insight into the practice of using, uh, adapting, uh, creating, designing open educational resources either by the teaching staff uh, themselves or in the cooperation with uh, uh, library staff or uh, so also independently or uh, by the support of their institution or even uh, governments. Also, we did uh, some research into uh, institutional uh, support for the teaching staff. So we got some results there, but uh, if we have time, we will mention them also. Now, I would just like to go through very quickly through some of the main um, graphs in our report uh, referring to digital education and open education resources. And as you can see here in the first graph, uh, we have uh, different aspects of digital education uh, that were implemented during COVID-19 pandemic at uh, LIS schools and departments. Uh, and as you can see, uh, almost most of them, almost all of them used live teaching sessions via different platforms like Zoom that we're using now, Big Blue Button, uh, Jitsi as an open source, uh, MS Teams and others. They also used uh, online communication with students either through these platforms or some other or uh, uh, through Skype and, and different tools. They used online examination um, and new ways, of course, of the assessment of uh, examinations and they use uh, uh, learning management systems, mostly Moodle, of course, in, in Europe. They also used online communication and collaboration with um, different uh, uh, institutions, uh, mostly with their distant colleagues and fellow educators, because, of course, you have to keep up your work and you have to keep up your research. So the communication needs to go on despite uh, lockdowns uh, and different uh, pandemic measures. And also uh, more than half of them uh, use digital repositories uh, of teaching and learning materials. As for techniques and strategies, uh, blended learning was the most used uh, strategy uh, in, of digital education. Uh, then of course, project-based learning and problem-based learning. Of course, the least used were virtual reality education and augmented reality education, which is of course, uh, even understandable since um, they ask for uh, a lot of input at the beginning. They can be quite costly. Uh, maybe they ask for uh, a different set of skills. And in the times of crisis, when you have to uh, carefully manage your resources and skills, sometimes uh, they can be quite overwhelming. So this could be one of the reasons why virtual reality education and augmented reality education weren't so represented uh, during uh, as a uh, digital education strategy during the pandemic. As for the tools uh, per se, they used uh, video conferencing tools, of course, uh, all of them, uh, learning management systems, and uh, mostly they were uh, integrated. So there were video conferencing tools integrated in learning management systems. Uh, online plagiarism detection systems were also uh, used by most of the uh, LIS institutions. Uh, but also social media repositories, online quizzes. Um, of course, uh, uh, there is one part uh, that was least used and these were digital credentials. So uh, we guess that um, there should be uh, some informed uh, decision-making strategies, planning regarding implementing digital credentials in higher education systems uh, more than we do it now. Uh, as for digital education resources, um, of course, uh, all of them use digital learning materials that were mostly provided through Moodle for different uh, learning management systems. Uh, they also used uh, e-textbooks, uh, digital open education resources, but what was interesting to us uh, as a main result of this research is actually that uh, many of the of the departments and schools uh, that uh, were a part of this research, uh, about 50% of them uh, weren't so aware of the concept of education or open education resources itself. Uh, they didn't use it so much, uh, even at the level of uh, using um, 
other uh, already available open education resources and what to say about uh, developing and creating uh, them by themselves. So this was one of the main uh, uh, findings in our research. Also, as for the software, uh, proprietary and free and open, open source software were used uh, almost uh, at the same level. Uh, when we say proprietary software, it is mostly uh, Zoom and MS Teams. And when we say free and open source, it's mostly uh, Moodle and Big Blue Button uh, and uh, Jitsi a bit. Um, of course, academic libraries played a crucial role during the pandemic, uh, even in the, uh, in the digital education field, but also when it comes to open education resources, as we will see, uh, academic libraries either provided uh, virtual information services, they provided materials to students, uh, they found uh, different new ways to uh, make their services more flexible, dynamic, and adjust them to the uh, uh, conditions of the, of the pandemic. Uh, but they also were involved, as we will see, in the creation of open education resources, and they were quite um, uh, helpful uh, to the teaching staff also either by providing uh, additional materials for the creation of open educational resources or by uh, directly being involved in the creation of open educational resources. As for the monitoring and evaluation procedures, most of the uh, LIS schools departments uh, did some kind of monitoring and evaluation of uh, digital education uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and when we want to see which aspects that did they specifically monitor and evaluate, as you can see, uh, those were online teaching and learning about more than half, about 62%. Uh, student learning outcomes, uh, student participation, uh, also teachers' performance. Um, some of them uh, were evaluating uh, new ways, um, uh, new forms of pedagogy, didactics, and methodology. Uh, that were being used during the pandemic, uh, also uh, teachers and students' uh, workload, and so on. So as for the digital education, monitoring and evaluation procedures were quite uh, represented, quite evident. Uh, the second part of the research was focused on open education resources, and our first goal was to see uh, whether the teaching staff uh, and heads of the departments were familiar with uh, open education resources repositories, uh, either uh, at their institution, at a national level or international level. So uh, when we asked them, do they have any kind of institutional repository uh, that has a collection of OERs, 45% uh, of them said yes, but that means that the majority uh, wasn't aware if they had or not, or they uh, didn't have it. Uh, is there a national repository of OERs in your country? Uh, only about 30% of them said, yes, there is. Also, again, uh, about 40% of them uh, responded negatively, and about 32% said that they were not familiar with the information. And when we asked them about specific LIS, uh, open education resources, uh, are there any repositories containing them? Uh, only 12% responded positively, while others were either not familiar with the information or uh, they said there weren't such repositories or they weren't using them. Um, what were the incentives or could be the incentives for OER implementation? Uh, this was something that we wanted to see. Um, so uh, most of them said there weren't any incentives. Uh, and that the creation and the implementation of OERs was actually the responsibility and the result of an engaged individual, someone from the teaching staff. Uh, also, uh, some of them were not familiar with uh, that information. Uh, we had this a lot, this answer we are not familiar with, we are not familiar with the concept or uh, with whether uh, OERs were uh, being used or not. Uh, which actually is indicative for us because we can see there is a certain lack of awareness first about the OERs and uh, this is one of the main reasons why they haven't been implemented as we were expecting them to be implemented, which actually a lot of other studies uh, showed also. 
Um, is there some specific project or program with the public funding? So mostly uh, the OER materials that were developed were developed uh, as a part of certain um, uh, public funded projects like uh, Digital Education for Christ Situation is also uh, producing uh, different materials as open education resources. Uh, for the types of software being used for the creation, adaptation and pre management of open education resources, uh, now we see that uh, mostly free and open source software is used, so mainly free and open source software. Again, proprietary software is also represented, uh, but uh, some uh, small part of uh, institutions said that they were developing it locally, their own software, because they had some particular needs um, uh, and they had some particular uh, goals uh, they uh, they were heading to, so they needed something for the for for themselves. Uh, nothing uh, was quite um, that was available. Uh, nothing was quite right for them, so they had to use something else or develop it locally. And also, again, develop it lo uh, locally means that some of the teaching stuff was developing. Uh, as for documents and procedures frameworks at uh, LIS schools and departments, uh, we can see that uh, regarding policy documents uh, or procedures frameworks for digital education in general at national level, uh, less than half of them said there are some kind of procedures. So when we see the procedures regarding open education resources, uh, there aren't many uh, policy documents uh, or some kind of uh, frameworks uh, that try to uh, manage the field of uh, open education and open education resources. Situation is a bit better uh, regarding digital education in general, but what we see is that uh, really at the uh, policies, so not just at programmatic level, but at the policy level, we need more engagement, uh, both from institutions, from government bodies. And now, uh, so these are just some of the findings uh, presented in the graphs. We have many more graphs uh, in our report, as you will see probably in a month or so. Uh, but just to uh, extrapolate uh, some key findings in this in this research, as we see um, during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there were different uh, aspects of digital education that were implemented. So mostly it was blended learning, but again, as I said, project-based uh, learning and problem-based learning were also implemented. Uh, most of LIS schools um, uh, and departments used uh, existing systems, they used existing tools uh, during pandemic. Uh, of course, in some cases, there were different discrepancies between the tools uh, or they were inadequate altogether, which means that um, for the future, not just for the crisis, but beyond the crisis, uh, higher education institutions should have some sort of informed planning and strategy in uh, developing or integrating digital education tools in their system. Um, in most cases, uh, the implementation uh, of digital education was ensured at institutional level, uh, but in more than a third of the cases, it was also a decision and responsibility, of course, of the individual teacher. Um, most of the list schools, uh, LIS schools, uh, carried out monitoring and evaluation, as, we, as you have seen, and this is quite a, a, a good point, uh, with also uh, almost all LIS schools and departments using uh, video conferencing tools, using um, uh, also uh, learning management systems, online plagiarism detection systems, so they really used a different array of tools to keep the communication between them and students and uh, to keep the nature um, uh, of the teaching and the learning process as uh, much as uh, intact as possible. Uh, also, all LIS departments and schools used digital learning materials, which is really encouraging, but uh, less encouraging is that uh, uh, about 50 or less percent of them used digital open educational uh, resources. Um, almost uh, all of the LIS schools also implemented new didactics in their teaching. Uh, they applied new methodology. Um, also, they tried to change their uh, pedagogies, which is actually really good. And this is something that is also very important in the context of changing the digital education. 
higher education, uh, not just in crisis situations, but beyond, and especially when we talk about the democratization of education. Uh, also, uh, school, LIS schools and departments uh, were very successful in addressing students' problems uh, that occurred or issues that occurred uh, during the pandemic regarding digital educations. They did it either through regular consultations, um, live online questions and answer sessions, uh, or they even provided different technical support uh, like video tutorials and um, written tutorials, documentation and similar. Um, digital platforms and tools that were used during the pandemic uh, were uh, fostered um, uh, they were actually uh, uh, developed in a sense that they uh, uh, incentivized um, uh, new curricula. So um, uh, the tools that we used uh, fostered the adaptation of the current or even uh, the modification and development of new curricula in more than uh, half of the LIS departments. So, uh, using digital tools, especially open educational resources, had some impact on the curricula, on the program. Uh, also, most of the teaching staff uh, had the option of customization, uh, of adaptation of their teaching and learning process, which is very important in the dynamic situations such as crisis situations. But also, it is very important for the uh, future uh, democratization of education. Um, academic libraries had a crucial role during the COVID-19 pandemic. They were either providers of necessary teaching and learning materials, uh, either in library, uh, with, of course, with a flexible working time, either through repositories, and they provided a virtual information services, which were quite helpful, especially for the first year undergraduate students who found themselves of a new surrounding during the pandemic. As for the key findings uh, referring to OERs and uh, the institutional and technical support, uh, what we could see is that the uh, majority of uh, departments and LIS schools stated that either there is no national repository of OERs in their country or that they are not familiar with the information. Uh, some implied um, that uh, they were familiar with the information but that they were not using them also, the same applies to the repository for uh, LIS OERs. Uh, the situation is a bit different with institutional repositories containing a collection of OERs where uh, almost uh, about half, uh, like half of the list uh, LIS schools departments uh, state that they have such repository, but uh, not all of them are using it. Uh, creating and implementing OERs was uh, often the result of the engaged individual, unfortunately, uh, though in some cases there were specific uh, governmental measures and incentives of projects or uh, that were publicly funded, as we said. Uh, I said unfortunately because uh, teaching staff can usually be uh, quite overwhelmed uh, with the new situation, uh, trying to keep up with the work, uh, and then uh, additionally being stressed with developing um, and managing open education resources uh, can have um, some sort of a, a negative impact uh, regarding the motivation to continue uh, with the practice. So uh, this shouldn't be just uh, uh, this shouldn't just stay at the level of an individual uh, engaged individual. Also, uh, in uh, most uh, of uh, the LIS schools and departments. Uh, uh, didn't use open education resources during the pandemic, as we said. Um, the reasons vary uh, from uh, lack of resources, uh, lack of support, uh, lack of awareness about open education resources, um, uh, lack of incentives. Uh, also, uh, they said, uh, well, whoever wants, he can, he or she can use it. So again, it was the decision of an individual teacher. Uh, in general, a small number of LIS schools and departments used OERs during the pandemic, which is consistent with uh, the findings of other different uh, studies. Uh, existing teaching materials were often used uh, as OERs, especially those that were already available uh, through Moodle. 
uh, and learning management systems, uh, there were different ways, of course, to motivate higher education institutions in general and uh, LIS departments in particular to adapt, uh, design, and author OERs. And we listed this, um, uh, we listed these ways in our report. So either through incentives, uh, through providing more time to the teaching staff. Uh, also to evaluating uh, this work as a research work. So different ways could be implemented to incentivize and motivate uh, the use and development and adaptation and managing of OERs. Uh, flexible teaching and learning, uh, open education and knowledge, uh, so distance edu education, resource-based learning, uh, effective and quality uh, teaching, and learning were some of the most representative uh, uh, or common reasons for developing, creating, and using OERs that were stated by our respondents. Um, as for the um, peer review of OERs, which is actually quite important for their quality, but also for their future development, uh, there was still an, just a, a number of uh, LIS schools uh, that did the peer review. Most of them uh, don't do the peer review of OERs, and it's mostly done by the, the, the person who created it. Uh, the curation and management uh, is also mostly done by the teacher or teachers who created uh, the OER. Uh, more than half of the OERs created within the institution were using open source software, uh, but what was indicative was that um, uh, most uh, of the respondents weren't familiar with the open licensing, you know, especially Creative Commons license, which should be used uh, like uh, open licensing, open standards, open formats. These are all uh, very important aspects of developing uh, open education resources. Of course, also important aspects of democratization of education in general. So also when we, uh, when we, uh, when, when we tried to see what was the role of academic libraries, uh, the role of academic libraries uh, in the creation and use of OERs during the pandemic uh, referred mostly to providing library materials, library resources uh, for planning, designing, and creating OERs. Uh, also, uh, they were providing infrastructure um, in the library. Uh, also, library staff also was sometimes involved directly or indirectly in the creation of OERs. Uh, only half of the LIS schools used OERs, uh, that used OERs also promoted and shared them, which is also one of the problems, uh, because uh, if we do not promote and share OERs, then um, uh, the public, the academia, the public, the uh, decision makers um, uh, are not going to be aware of their existence and uh, they, will, they will not be aware of their importance and then we will, we will have less uh, investing uh, financially uh, regarding time and organization in the development of OERs. As for the institutional and practical support, they were provided during COVID-19 for them. Miliana, please yes, the time. come to the... Yes, the time is running away. Please okay. go so to conclusion. So for the conclusion, uh, just how, mu how much time do I have? Uh, you're actually over, <laughs> but over. Uh, please okay. wrap so up. I, this, is, this is always my problem. As I said, <laughs> uh, the, it is quite a long uh, report. So just for the conclusion, I will take a minute. What we saw is that um, digital education and open education resources were transforming uh, the teaching and learning process quite disruptively. Uh, and they uh, were indicated in the sense that we saw what other, uh, what other um, uh, as I said, what other uh, studies have shown, did a uh, COVID-19 pandemic actually bring a large scale adoption of OERs? What we saw is no, they didn't. Um, uh, only half of the respondents said that they were aware of they were using OERs. And we see OERs as very uh, important for the democratization of education, not just in crisis situations, but beyond, because they provide access to education. They provide um, uh, especially access to education to those who are maybe socioeconomically uh, impacted by the by the pandemic or by the crisis, and they uh, uh, contribute to the education as a public benefit. Uh, one other important issue is um, that OERs and digital education are in, uh, rely on increased 
use of technological resources. So again, here we should rely more on free and open source software, open formats, licensing uh, standards, and actually open education in, in general. So there were some positive trends, there were some negative trends, but all in all, um, we hope that this study will uh, provide a basis for further research and also for some policy planning uh, and some uh, program changes okay. at higher education institutions. Great. Thank you very much, Miljana. <laughs> Lots of results from this study. I can highly recommend you to read the report once it will be online very soon. So thank you for putting this into yes, a short you. time. Yes. Exactly. yes so, uh, ah, yeah, the uh, link is there. Thank you. So yeah, this I think very interesting. We see that uh, everybody says, oh, the pandemic has led to a disruption and a shift towards digitalization. Well, we see not always and not everywhere and not in such intensity and with such good planning, we see that a lot of problems remain and a lot of issues are missing, especially if we talk about this great potential of open educational resources. So thanks to OSEC team. Thank you very much. And we move to the next talk. Again, we talk for now about one school, one particular example where the uh, digital shift has maybe been uh, conducted very successfully. So I welcome again two speakers from the University of Hildesheim. The next presentation will be given by Theresia Woltermann and Joachim Griesbaum. Joachim is a professor for information science at the University of Hildesheim and he has previously done the PhD at the University of Konstanz uh, with Rainer Kuhlen who is well known in the domain and he's uh, his work is on information management, online teaching, uh, uh, online marketing and other areas. And uh, with him is uh, talking Theresia Woltermann, who was involved in this project. She finished a master degree at the University of Hildesheim in 2020. And now she was uh, the research assistant involved in this project that from what I understand will be the topic of the talk, so I don't have to say anything uh, else anymore and for the sake of time, please start. The floor is yours. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas, for the nice introduction. Um, first question, can you hear me? It's very good, yes. Yes, uh, that, uh, that's a good thing. Okay, um, as said, I'm Joachim Griesbaum, information scientist from the University of Hildesheim. And today we want to talk about intercultural perspectives on information literacy education. Yes, hello also from uh, me too. Uh, sorry, I can't see myself. So uh, maybe sometimes the turn taking won't be so... Um, yeah, won't work so well, but my name is Theresia Woltermann. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, and I'm also very glad to be here. Thank you. So in today's presentation, we want to, of course, give you an idea about the transnational learning scenario. Um, we conducted uh, uh, and uh, also about the new project that is uh, yeah that has already started this winter semester. Uh, we want to share with you uh, results from this first experience of this transnational online learning scenario, as well as challenges. Um, then after that, we want to show you the concept in more detail of the second project. Uh, intercultural perspectives on information literacy and meta literacy and then also show you a short video of the students feedback. So the first thing is the question, what is it all about? And the basic idea is that we try to learn about topics related to information literacy by taking into account a wider perspective, a transnational perspective. Students learn with students together with students from other locations, cultures. Here, Pune Hildesheim, which two uh, locations that started the project. And that goes hand in hand, also intercultural learning um, is supported by providing a joint learning space. This is the basic idea, fostering information literacy by encountering yeah, um, um, 
perspectives uh, or co-learners from other cultures. And we did uh, first, um, yeah, um, try and, and in 2019 before the pandemic, but the first serious um, endeavor was last year. Uh, where Pune and Hildesheim um, collaboratively conducted this online course or started this online course. You see here the structure. Um, some 20 students, um, eight from Hildesheim, 14 from Pune, collaboratively worked together in groups <clears throat> um, covering specific aspects of information literacy. Mentioned here information behavior in Corona times. Um, <clears throat> confirmation bias, what I believe is surely true, um, the impact of, of the pandemic on the education sector and the question how to cultivate information literacy in rural environments. Um, students worked together in November and December on this uh, in-depth questions and they provided or constructed artifacts, screencasts, and these screencasts were presented to the world on an online conference. And this was here, as he mentioned, as phase three. Uh, we conducted a small online conference with keynote speakers, Tom McKee, Trudy Jacobson, probably known to you, I can imagine. And the students presented their results. And we did some um, um, concluding workshop um, with, um, concerning the question on intercultural perspectives and information literacy. And <clears throat> Also, the colleagues from Sarajevo sitting here on the table, uh, Emia and Mario were involved. So we had three things. We had a phase one where students just get together, got together and um, developed a common ground. We got a phase two where they um, worked in, um, on specific topics collaboratively. And we had a phase three where they shared their knowledge with the world. That was the basic, I basic idea of this this project. So um, just to give you a short um, idea uh, what kind of uh, tools we used during this first transnational online learning course. Uh, so uh, on, on number one, you can see um, the poster we used to find students, uh, both in Hildesheim and in Pune. Uh, yes, to motivate them, of course, to, to register for this um, course. And we felt that uh, we needed to already give them a first idea uh, on the structure of the course, um, because, of course, this kind of learning scenario, um, first online, but also with, with another university from another country, might be new to the students. So we gave them um, yeah, the, the first structure and also uh, uh, an idea of the learning topics that uh, might be uh, yeah, topics of the, of the learning course. And then on number two, you see the, the Moodle or the, the Learn Web uh, we used during the course, um, which was very good because we had this joint learning space for all the students, uh, the German and the Indian students, the German teachers, the Indian teachers, and uh, we had the big blue button conference, uh, video conferences also on this uh, joint learning space, as well as a forum, all of the information, uh, the, the presentation slides. So we used this uh, space for the whole course. Then on number three, you can see a screenshot from the YouTube channel uh, that is still active today. You are uh, invited, of course, to, to see um, where we also streamed the online conference mentioned before, as well as the screencasts uh, the, the students uh, submitted as learning task. Um, also uh, a short video feedback we want to share with you later. Uh, so this was all, um, or this is all together in this, on this YouTube channel. Uh, yeah, some some first results uh, from this uh, first uh, course uh, we had um, the average group grades of the learning artifacts were, were very good. So we had four groups, which means that we had four learning artifacts in the end. 
um, uh, with an average grade of 1.6, which is, as you can see in the scale below, between very good and good. Um, so uh, the, the quality of the learning artifacts was very high. Also, we had a low dropout rate um, and we got very direct positive feedback from, from the students who participated in the scenario. Um, just, just to show you one quote, um, one student said, the exchange of knowledge that occurred during the course of this program was extremely enriching and I am beyond grateful that this opportunity was presented to me. Being a part of this course has helped me build my interest in the field of information literacy and I can't wait to be a part of such courses in the future. So of course here uh, we see on, on the one hand the, the, the social <laughs> aspect uh, of this inter international uh, endeavor but also uh, of course which is um, a very good outcome is that the, the interest um, uh, increased in, in the subject of information literacy. Uh, so this was very encouraging for us to have this positive feedback after the four, first course. But of course, there were also challenges. <laughs> um, uh, a, a very big challenge, of course, was the coordination and organization of the learning scenario concerning semester times, for example, but also the time difference. There is, um, I think now with summertime in Europe, uh, I think 4.5 hours um, difference in the time zones. So this is of course uh, an organizational challenge that always uh, needs to be uh, thought of uh, in international collaboration and also community building within the group, um, which is also inherent uh, to tomorrow. and we faced. Yeah, so so far to the past, now to the, to the future. Um, maybe this learning scenario is not for everyone. Yeah, not every student is engaged or in the idea of intercultural learning, but those who did were very happy. And we as instructors were also very happy. And the idea is to expand and to continue this project. And therefore we have developed a concept on three levels. Three levels. First, the community level, where we try to bring in additional partners interested in such a learning scenario or idea. And we're very happy that Sarajevo is on board in, in, the, in the current cycle and that um, partners from US and Austria are, have also joined um, our endeavor. And I guess and hope we are, yeah, we will be, we will continue and we will even expand more. That would be a um, big hope um, for, for us. What we also have provided is a learning environment where everyone can, um, yeah, on, on, on can uh, bring in learning content, and we are not no longer dependent on um, the infrastructure of single universities. This is what we call the community level. Then we have this thing called learning cycle. Um, that's a bit of a challenge to, to coordinate the learning tasks. With a on, 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 on top of a diverse group or diverse groups of students, and also with this organizational um, constraints with regard to term times or uh, yeah, uh, time zones, for example. And we developed, um, or we think this this six step or six phases process is, is a way to go onboarding, then defining learning tasks, group building. Um, initiation and control of collaboration rounds, then um, providing feedback and also to bring it together um, at the end. And here we learned a lot and I guess um, it works. It really works. Um, it, is, is, it is the way to go. And finally, on, on, the, on the most specific level, the question of the learning tasks and the, the question on how to build the groups, how to to, to control and support um, um, group work 
And here we are open. I guess it makes sense that every partner brings in a learning task which are important or of interest from his or her side. Yeah, that's that's the concept of the, the new project or yeah, the frame in which we collaborate. And at the moment we have um, yeah six partners. Um, you see here Sarajevo University of Graz, Hildesheim, Pune, the University of Albany, and Sunny Empire. Uh, we have uh, the current the course is currently underway. I guess we have roughly 30 students, and they are really um, <laughs> and working collaboratively. And we will see the first results on yeah in two day no, no, in, in three days on next Thursday. Okay, this is just the cover slide of the, of the current course. Intercultural perspectives on information literacy and meta literacy. We expanded the theme a bit um, with meta literacy, and here you can see the partners. And this is also the, the poster or the short description of the current um, course. The concept is basically um, the same. We had a get together phase in October, November, and we have this collaboration phase, and we will also have a, um, an online conference in January. And this is it. We already decided that the conference is on Friday, January 28th, from um, one o'clock until early evening, Central European time. Um, <clears throat> And on the online conference, we will have a workshop on intercultural aspects of information literacy education, and also our students present their results. And you are very much invited. And if it's only to check out if you're probably interested in joining in, in, in next year. Yes, I uh, want to show you now the video, if we still have time, but I think it's okay, then I would just sh stop sharing and then share again. Uh, if you have audio, just uh, check the also to, to share audio, please. Uh, yeah, I, I think I did. I can, I think it's fine. Can you? It's working you, well. It's working? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. trustworthy. Therefore, it is important to create opportunities for students to learn in new settings and to be able to cultivate skills that aid them holistically. Initiatives like the collaborative course on the intercultural perspectives on information literacy focus on the development of soft skills on teaching research methodology, good scientific practices and communication which play an integral role in the shaping of a great and effective lifelong learner. Thus, I personally believe that information literacy proves to be the next big thing that needs to be added to the national agenda for learning. Thank you. Hello everyone, myself Neha Kumar. I'm currently pursuing a master's in literature at St. Francis College Pune. This intercultural course has given me a lot of learnings and perspectives. The knowledge imparted by everyone who were part of this collaboration opened more arenas for us. It gave us a wider perspective of not only the topics assigned to us, but also culture, discipline, and how to work as a team. It provided us with a platform where we were allowed to make mistakes and learn from them simultaneously, which gave us a confidence to face more challenges. Learning here is a process that can be pursued with zeal. It has no restrictions. 
Its arms are wide open, irrespective of age or the background one comes from. It teaches us how we all are one, where we learn and unlearn a lot of things. And the findings that we got from researching help us to understand the functioning of the media and other countries as well. It gives us a broader area of how other things work as well. And for which I'm grateful that I was part of this collaboration. The learnings and the confidence I gained from this, from regular meetings and interacting with the, uh, people from different countries, helped us a lot. And this would definitely help me up for my future endeavors. Thank you. I'm Leah Sevlani, and I'm currently studying Masters in English Literature from Symbiosis. I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to be a part of this intercultural course. I do believe that a thorough guide for the social media platform used, Moodle, would have made it easier and convenient for us to report our progresses as well as submit our assignments. Another suggestion I have is to spread out the one-day conference at the end of the course to two days because it became difficult to absorb all the information provided. If it would have been spread out like the rest of the course, it would have ensured a smoother ending to an enriching experience. Overall, this course has been incredibly fulfilling and instrumental in developing an insight into information literacy. Hello, my name is Amiya and I have been a part of an international initiative which was held by the University of Hildesheim, Germany, in collaboration with Symbiosis College of Arts and Commerce, Pune, called Intercultural Perspectives on Information Literacy. I had a lot to learn from this course, things that will help me throughout my career in whatever capacity. To break down my experience with the course, I'd like to give a detailed description about the challenges and the opportunities that I encountered while being a part of the intercultural community. Some of the opportunities include the fact that I was given access to a wide variety of scientific literature, which enhanced my knowledge on a variety of topics. I had the opportunity to get a glimpse of how things worked on the other side of the world without having to travel a thousand miles with my I learned how to look for the right scientific literature, properly read it, extract relevant data, and of course, how to cite it correctly. My teammates from Hildesheim University were a big uh, help when it came to the citation work. Making a video of our artifact and posting it on the second largest search engine in the world was definitely a cherry on top of the pie. The response we received for the same was overwhelming. Lastly, the online conference held on the 30th of January was phenomenal. The presentation given by Dr. Thomas McKay and Professor Trudy Jacobson was extremely informative. To be able to speak with students, professors, co-authors around the world was enlightening to say the very least. Some of the challenges that we encountered during the course were operating the OBS studio efficiently and therefore it became very difficult for us to edit the video in time. As a group, sometimes there arose conflicts regarding whether content from certain scientific literature was to be included in the artifact or not. Yeah, that were some impressions from, from the students, um, Indian students, as you have could have seen. And we thank you very much um, for the opportunity to present the project in, in, in this audience. And we thank also all the collaboration partners in India and um, Sarajevo, Austria and US, because uh, it's not only a great experience for the students, but also for the instructors. Thank you. Oh, Thank wonderful. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> Applause from the room and online. Thank you, uh, Theresia and Johan, for this insight. We see the virtual your cooperation, the virtual education, if it's well planned and well carried out, it can still uh, be very uh, uh, positive. And we hope that this will continue after the pandemic and that we will. Uh, students, we give students a lot of opportunities here, or you give students a lot of opportunities in this course, and I think that's certainly very good. So, looking at the clock, I see that we finished exactly on time with this uh, um, uh, with this podium here, with this session. 
of the three talks. I thank all the three uh, speakers again very much, or the five speakers actually, uh, for their uh, three presentations. And with that, I will go there, let everybody into the break, and we have a break of 15 minutes. Yes. Uh, so please, we go into the break puncture. We hopefully can start again and see you then in 15 minutes again online and here in the room. Thank you.
Uh, welcome all back. Uh, due to probably some uh, uh, technical issues or other conflicts, our uh, special guest speaker, uh, Dr. Alto Grizzle from UNESCO, is still not with us in our uh, hybrid model of the conference. Those are the uh, unfortunate, but uh, to expect some of the last minute uh, uncertainties. So we'll just continue with the, with the program. We'll continue with the program and have our uh, very dear and uh, 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 friend and, and a guest, uh, uh, Uros um, Krčadinac, to, to address. Mari, would you like to introduce our guest briefly, please? Yes. Uh, Uroj is uh, assistant professor at Singedunum University, <coughs> Belgrade, and he is, uh, I would say, the coder, educator, data artist, and uh, his presentation is going to cover uh, some of his field work, I would say, in Serbia, in elementary school, am I right? High school. High school. It can also be applied to elementary school. Yeah. So I'm looking forward uh, to uh, uh, to have him uh, uh, today in Sarajevo and uh, to hear his uh, speech and uh, actually uh, learn about some new, uh, let's say, aspects uh, in digital humanities, I would say. Thank you, Mark. Do you hear me? Uh, OK. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Uroš. Uh, I would like, uh, first of all, to thank Mario for inviting me and to thank Emir for this beautiful introduction. Uh, my name is uh, Uroš Kaczadinac. Uh, I come from Belgrade and I'm going to talk about creative coding in Balkan schools, making algorithmic art a part of official high school curriculums in Serbia. Um, sorry, just to check. Try now. Yes? Uh, yes, I'm a digital and data artist, uh, as Mario said, technologist, writer and educator, and as an educator I, uh, um, I work uh, at several institutions, mainly as an assistant professor of both digital art and computer science at the Faculty of Media and Communications in Belgrade. I'm also a research associate at the good old AI, AI lab at the University of Belgrade, and I'm a visiting lecturer at the uh, new media department at University of Arts Novi Sad. Uh, so that's, uh, that's for these official educational-like institutions, but I do a lot of informal uh, education too. Um, I travel a lot. I teach with, uh, with different kinds of, kinds of students from elementary school, from high school, also adults students at the university, I do a lot of workshops, so I'm acquainted with informal ways of, of teaching and learning and education as well as, as these formal ones. And uh, being uh, like a transdisciplinary person in general, my formal background is in uh, computing, is in informatics, but my informal background is in art and animation and, and uh, creative writing, so uh, in everything I do I try somehow to bridge these things and I see myself as a, as a bridge person, a person who bridges different disciplines and, and different ways of, ways of thinking. And this was the, the inspiration for this, uh, for this project as well. So this would be some kind of a conceptual diagram of, of things that I, try to, uh, that I try to put together. Art from one side, writing and software. And this particular project I'm going to talk about, it's, uh, it's about algorithmic art, it's about creative coding and how to make it a part of the official high school programs in, in Serbia and uh, probably you can, you can guess how rigid and how conservative all that is and how hard it is to put something like this in, in a curriculum. It's, it's, it was immensely hard. I work in these, in these fields for 10 or 15 years, so it's not new to me, and it was actually much, much easier to you know, invent these lectures, to write these curriculums, to draw these illustrations, to code these examples, than to, to actually get it to be a part of the official educational system. Uh, it is a free and openly licensed internet course 
for high school students and it is the first such course that enables teachers of visual art, of computer science and math to use parts of our course in their, in their official lectures and to actually grade them and uh, these grades that these teachers can give based on, on our lectures can actually be the official grades. So it's not part of the official curriculum in a sense that all teachers have to use this. It's, uh, it's, like a, it's like a plugin, an educational plugin. It is online. It's on the Petlia website. It was uh, produced by UNICEF, Petlia Foundation, and Digital Serbia Initiative. So it's something that teachers, those who are enthusiastic about these kinds of new uh, innovative digital practices, can use in, in their everyday, everyday work. And uh, knowing the situation, I guess there won't be a lot of these teachers. So far, I think there are like uh, 10, 20, 30, 30 teachers so far that we know that they're using this and it exists online for, for a couple of months. Uh, but it's a start and I, I'm happy for, for this being a start. This is one of the illustrations created, one of the examples, one of the visuals they can, they can create by coding. So the, all this you can see, all these like vector graphics, raster graphics have been created by using analytical geometry, by using, you know, like coding algorithms. So it's fully like algorithmic structural art, but it's also something that you can use to teach color theory, to teach like visual composition and also teach data visualization, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, so yeah, what was like the ethos, the idea behind all this? It, it's the idea that in the era of big data and algocracy, there is a need for, for a new forms of literacy that connect computing, mathematics, art, and society. And uh, this, this course that we made, it's, it's conceived as an answer to this need and also as something that could be fun for high school students, something that could, you know, energize them, motivate them to create something beautiful, but also something that could, you know, uh, eventually become a, a, new, a new way of talking about complex systems. Uh, this is something I already said mostly. Uh, we haven't, for example, uh, dealt with this particular stuff as computer games, but they can, of course, use the knowledge that gained during this course also to create stuff such as computer games. Interactive uh, installations, different kind of online animations, different kind of like new interactive cinematography, many, many, many possibilities are are available and open. Uh, and uh, it was based on P5.js technology. It's a JavaScript library that somehow is connected to the pro processing initiative and the processing project. The processing was written in Java. P5 is actually processing for JavaScript. Uh, to say it in plain English, it's something that makes creative coding available for people who work on the web in the browser so they can create all these interactive stuff in the browser and they can share it with their peers, they can share it with their students, they can make something that's exciting and fun and it's um, open and available to everybody online and it is also intended to be open source so anybody can actually change it, they can learn from one another, they can continue projects, they can build upon previous projects, so it's also a story about how to uh, introduce uh, the culture of open source, the culture of, you know, critical making, uh, hacking cultures, how to introduce these things in high school. So this was a way of, like, uh, like the way rock and roll was used to talk about some, uh, some, you know, revolutionary societal aspects. This is the way how to introduce this, this, this let's say, radical in a positive way aspects of computing culture already in high school. Uh, yeah, uh, it all started with the processing foundation in the States. Uh, the entire project was intended to make, uh, to make uh, learning, uh, to make coding available to people who are not engineers, to make coding available for people who are Designers, architects, artists, beginners, different kinds of amateurs, writers, musicians, people who are creatives or journalists or people from humanities, people from social sciences, how to make this coding not something that is only for people who actually have a degree in, in software engineering, but something that anybody can do, at least uh, to some degree, and especially for visual le learners. 
uh, and this is how it looks like. You have code on the left, on the right you can get this kind of a interactive animated, uh, animated visual and uh, it can be, you know, simple, it could be complex, it could be based on, 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 on different, different algorithms and if we have time later I can also show you on a computer how it all works. Uh, or we can uh, arrange it during the break or I can, I mean, show you in, in any way. Uh, I'm available also after the conference so you're free to to write and to we, we can stay in touch and I can show you all of these, you know, like technical aspects of this. Uh, these uh, programs don't have to be long, they can be actually quite short, but still provide really exciting, you know, visual output. They can, of course, be, be complex, so they can be used also for teaching computer science, which so far has, at least in, in Balkan schools, been thought as something really, you know, uh, mathematically strict, rigid, structural, something that doesn't have anything to do with, with creativity, with design, with making, with actual life, with the uh, actual society. So it's very abstract and at the same time it's very conservative. And, uh, and one of the ideas is how to make this like anti-conservative. And these are just some of the visuals we've made and prepared for the, for the course. And these are some of the topics that includes Perlin noise and Truchet tiles and uh, also we've uh, somehow mm, went through the, the short history of digital art during the last couple of decades and, and presented also these topics to, to high school students because they don't have uh, um, any subject uh, uh, or field during their uh, formative education in elementary high school where they can actually learn these things. They are completely, they, they live in this digital culture, this digital culture of memes and animations and video games. This is something that's completely their culture. They're, uh, you know, they, they swim in this culture and it's completely non-existent in their, in their um, school, school curriculums. And in my opinion, it's a problem and it's something that we should, uh, we should somehow try to overcome that. Uh, yeah, this is the example of, of this interface that uh, Petlia created together with uh, Vidunicev. And uh, the actual course was written by the four of us, Ivan, Milena, Alexandra and me. And uh, Ivan and Milena are mathematicians. Alexandra is a teacher of new media art at the Belgrade Academy of Fine Arts. And I'm a digital artist and teacher myself, so we kind of combined our skills. And with our powers combined, we created this course. And just some of the visuals that we've made as, as illustrations. Together, each one of these visuals within the course has a story. Uh, and this story includes, like, what does this mean in terms of new media art, in terms of culture, in terms of, uh, uh, terms of digital art, but also what does it mean in terms of math and how to actually make it by coding. So you have all these aspects available to, to both teachers and students. Can you see the thing? Okay. Oh yes, you have it over there. Yeah. This one was made by Alexandra Jovanić. This one too. This is an example. How can they create this kind of particle effect? The animate particle effect. Uh, I've made these ones, these illustrations, which are actually uh, playing with uh, particle systems. How you can paint with particle systems and how you can actually get things which are quite like hand-drawn using, using something that is math. And the idea is also to create an exhibition during the next year with, with things that, uh, that students and teachers made with this. So all of this stuff is basically math and analytical geometry coded by JavaScript, but it's, uh, it's so far away from the, from the classical standard uh, methodology of teaching math and coding in high schools. And it's also very much different from anything teachers of visual art do, do in high schools. Hmm. Yeah, and so far I've been talking about, 
you know, uh, the art part of it and the technology part of it, but the third part of it is, is uh, as important as these two, maybe, maybe the most important, and this, this is the part I would call society, or in particular systems literacy and how we can use, how we can harness this power of, of digital art in order to foster systems literacy. Uh, and uh, we can do it, for example, by data visualization. This illustration shows all uh, significant earthquakes uh, on Earth during the last 100 years. And also, this is an animated version of the same thing. So they can, they can learn how to uh, visualize complex things like earthquakes, but also coronavirus spreading, also, uh, you know, economical systems, the, the way financial colonization works, uh, the way uh, climate change works. Uh, these, uh, these systems are, you know, the main thing we, we, we are supposed to, to understand and to be able to, to talk about with people from, from elementary school and high school and so far. We, we don't have effective ways of doing that. So it is, my, uh, it is my belief that we can somehow harness this power of data visualization in order to, to, to improve systems literacy. Uh, also different visualizations of time and historical processes. The idea was to try to redesign the clock. A clock doesn't have to, you know, have only these three uh, these three, how do you call it in English? Kazalke yeah, handles. These three handles of a clock. A clock can actually be completely reinvented. So one of the one of the tasks uh, in the in the in the curriculum for the students is to try to to redesign the clock, to invent new ways of showing time. So the the the, the middle one is a clock where uh, horizontal lines present hours, vertical lines present minutes, and uh, these diagonal ones present seconds. Uh, and uh, these ones, for example, are the ones where handles are put at the end of each other. So imagine having a handle for minutes. At the end of handle for minutes, you have a handle for seconds. So you somehow foster completely new ways of imagining how systems work and how we as humans are part of these complex systems. And uh, uh, this idea of systems literacy is something I took from James Bridal. He's uh, an artist and technologist and writer from, from the UK. He lives in Greece now, and this is his book, New Dark Age. Uh, and I would like to, to read a couple of sentences from his book because I believe it's important in this context. Uh, and he says, uh, what is required is not understanding but literacy. And true literacy in systems consists of much more than simple understanding. One of the arguments often made in response to weak public understanding of technology is a call to increase technological education in its simplest formulation to learn the code. Such a call is made frequently by politicians, technologists, pundits, and business leaders, and is often advanced in nakedly functional and pro-market terms. The information economy needs more programmers, and young people need jobs in the future. So this is, um, let's say, uh, the main trap that we were trying to avoid. So it's beautiful to learn uh, these technologies and to teach them and to understand them and to play creatively, but it's somehow futile if we don't understand the wider social context within which these technologies are actually being promoted and used and the way they are being abused to is something that is really, really cr crucial, I think, even for high, stu high school students to, to, to open these questions and to try to problematize these things. So James Bridey continues that learning to code is not enough, just as learning to plumb a sink is not enough to understand the complex interactions between water tables, political geography, aging infrastructure, and uh, uh, social policy. Uh, that shape and produce the actual, actual life, you know, that's being within these systems. So these are some of the questions that we would like the course to at least open. We didn't have enough space to make this a focal point of the course. We've just somehow, uh, using, using some questions, tried to, to foster, uh, uh, try to make students ask these questions for themselves and to discuss them among their groups and to try to open this problem of computational thinking, this problem of, uh, um, of understanding the world itself only in computational terms, only in algorithmic terms, because 
we talk a lot about algorithmic literacy, about learning, about teaching kids how to code, but this is not enough. They also need to learn how to think creatively. They also need to be problem solvers and they need to understand, you know, why their systemic and social context within which they live. So this systemic literacy is the thinking that deals with a world that is not computable while acknowledging that is ir irrevocably shaped and informed by computation. So in a sense, this is this triangle I'll be talking about uh, throughout the lecture, connecting art and design from one side, society and literacy on the other, and data and technology uh, as the third, third point. And this is just an example of what some students made together with me using this course, a collection of uh, illustrations of the coronavirus that can be also used for data visualization. It's not drawn by hand, it's all coded. And these, you know, really organic shapes is something that you can achieve by, by using some special functions. And uh, you can also use it as, uh, as churn off faces, like different parameters can actually be mapped to different kind of uh, uh, different, uh, different data points, different dimensions within a data set, and it can also be animated. So this is uh, officially the end of the presentation. Thank you, everybody. And uh, if we have more time later, I can actually show you. Uh, you can try to code with me if you want. I can show you some of these things in, in uh, real time. And if you have some questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Urus, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll have opportunity, uh, please, Join us here. Uh, okay. We'll have opportunity to kind of uh, use the opportunity to have you here in, in, in the physical space and uh, have a, a, a discussion on the end of this panel. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, we have our dear colleague, uh, Dr. Alton Grizzle, uh, online. Uh, we managed to overcome the technical uh, differences. So, Alton, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Um, yes, um, Professor Amir, I can hear you very clearly. I can see so, the panel as well. Great. Uh, you can uh, uh, turn on the camera maybe and uh, while I introduce you. Um, Alton Grizzel is a um, uh, program specialist at UNESCO for Media Information Literacy. But uh, more importantly, uh, he's uh, 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 energy behind uh, the new wave of putting media information literacy on the world stage and agenda. Um, Alton is uh, one of the, the key reasons why Mario and myself got together working on the media information literacy together with Alton some six years ago now, Alton, it, it, it was a long time ago, but it, it went really quickly because we were so occupied in, in research and development, uh, trying to, to, to demystify all the challenges in Bosnia and Herzegovina society and the region, try to find the best ways forward. And uh, thanks to your uh, groundwork you have done with UNESCO on um, uh, making this uh, joint uh, in integral understanding of media information literacy and the first curriculum in 2011, we were able to build upon the, the shoulders and the work that you and UNESCO have done. Uh, it's our great pleasure to have you here and please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Emir. It's just such a pleasure to, um, to, to, uh, to be here today and to join uh, this uh, uh, noble panel. Uh, that's a hum humbling uh, introduction that you have given to me. And uh, I, I, I quickly give it all back to UNESCO <laughs> and people like yourself. You know, you 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 put it correctly when you say you know um, you spoke about shoulders and standing 
on, on shoulders. And um, I think, um, and this is UNESCO perspective that we are slowly um, seeing over mountains where media and information literacy is concerned and the, the importance and urgency of um, this, um, you know, comprehensive or umbrella type of literacy term, you know, and, you know, we're able to see over mountains because there are many giants like yourself, Professor Emir and Mario and many others on the panel and many other stakeholders that UNESCO works with um, all over the all over the globe. And so, um, you know, we're also thankful to our strong cooperation with the European Commission, um, who um, has been a main collaborator and partner and, and support financially for quite a bit of the work that UNESCO has been doing, not just in Bosnia, Herzegovina, but um, in the rest of the region, the rest of um, Eastern Europe um, to promote media and information literacy to empower citizens uh, in the region to build trust uh, in media. Today, I want to speak to you very briefly um, about the topic media and information literate citizens thinking critically, think critically, click wisely. And uh, Alton, um, just, just to comment, uh, uh, probably you have two screens, uh, you shared the, the, the one with the notes. Uh, so uh, it's a smaller window. Okay, uh, so okay, just, two screens projecting on. Okay, let me just unplug just, my screen. Just switch, I think that's what is happening. Yeah, just okay. switch. Uh, is it? Share the one with the. Uh, with, uh, okay, let me so, go again. Yeah, I think I had my big screen plugged in, but uh, let me just um, adjust that. Okay. Yes. Has it changed? Excellent now. Good. Okay. Voila. Okay. So, yes, I'll be talking to you briefly about the topic on media and information literate citizens think critically, click wisely. But I will be focusing on the new resource, which bears the name of the topic of this presentation that UNESCO launched recently. This is the second edition of the UNESCO Media and Information Literacy Curriculum for educators and learners. And it is indeed titled Media and Information Literate Citizens, Think Critically, Click Wisely. I enjoyed you know, quite thoroughly the presentation just now um, you know, from the previous um, present, pre present, pre presenter uh, talking about systems literacy. And um, you know, as he pointed out again, not a, not a new term, uh, but there are so many different notions of uh, literacy. And if we are going to ensure that we bring the educators and policymakers on board to embrace and to make media and information literacy a part of the formal education system, we need a sort of a harmonized approach to these different notions um, of, of, of um, literacy. To talk to you about this curriculum, I want to remind you about what the previous um, presenter also just said. I didn't get his name. I think it was Mario who presented just now, am I correct? Um, you know, who presented just before I, I came in uh, and looking at how people can see the world and to see systems and to see social issues from a different uh, dimensions. Many years ago, many years ago, when I started in this field, with UNESCO, it, you know, it might have been 10 years ago, attended a conference in, in, in Germany. And uh, it's a conference on media literacy. At the time, it was being called media education. Uh, and there's, there was this very unique image as you're seeing on your screen. It's a map of the world transformed into different social uh, and digital communications uh, platforms and, and, and companies. And if you, if you see this world as, as the previous um, presenter pointed out, this is where most of our young people and indeed adults we're living today, we're living in this virtual uh, electronic or digital world, you know, where the world is transformed. Now we're looking at the social media having over 4 billion um, 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 people on social media, more than half the world population. 
But if we could get our young people as a part connection with what Mar Marius was saying, to start seeing the connection with their virtual world, their virtual reality, that as they live in Bosnia Herzegovina or North Macedonia or Serbia, if they're living in, in, a, in parts of Africa or Europe or Latin America or you know, in the Arab states, that they're in fact also living in a virtual world. So it's that, it's that merging of the virtual world and the physical world. And how do we get young people, do we get citizens and everyone, all people to understand these linkages? How do we get them to draw that line between what they do and how they operate and live and interact, interact and participate in social life in the physical world, for example, elections and voting, and how all of that is mediated online in the virtual world. It's not something that is very easy um, to do, but this is the vision that UNESCO has behind media and information literacy, is to get people to realize that as we have rules in the physical world, when we're driving, the stoplights mean something. All right, we have road signs and they mean something and we have to respect these rules. That there are a set of rules as well online in the virtual world, in the digital world, in the electronic world. Sometimes these rules might not be standardized. They might not be, um, how do you say, um, you know, um, established according to international standards and they might not be widely practiced in a country, region or globally. But these rules, they do exist. And as human beings interacting with digital technology, interacting with the virtual world, and I don't want to say just interacting because you know, it should be more that we're driving the virtual world because the virtual world doesn't exist by itself. You know, the digital world you know, does not exist by itself. It is us people and our minds driving this virtual world that we, we need to then make that translation, make that direct link between these two sets of two sets of rules. This is the vision um, behind this UNESCO Media and Information Literacy Curriculum. You can see the different aspect of this um, virtual map, this map transformed map, and I'm sure you will agree that we're all living in the different parts of the world. But if you look closely at the map, you will see that they're not only the issues of social media or internet platforms or digital communication platform, but there are implications also that radio still exists. You see the radio palego or the sea of, 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 of television. These form of traditional media, they still exist and more than half the world population are still depending on radio, for example as the main means of communication. And so how do we capture that as we grapple with the onslaught and the wave towards the digital that the COVID-19 itself has accelerated? You know, we see that more people are dependent, not just people, but our social and economic machinery globally has become more dependent over the past two, three years on digital platforms because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is waking us up. And so we need that blended approach to keep in mind the traditional media, to keep in mind that reading and books are still central part of the information ecology. And so to, to um, to embellish a little bit on that, and then I'll, I'll come to the curriculum, but I want to use this sort of framing um, before coming to this curriculum that UNESCO has, has developed. Some years ago, years ago as well, um, I was in a conference for UNESCO and we were speaking at the 30th anniversary celebration of CLEMI. Some of you might know CLEMI, it's the, the Center for Media and Information Literacy here in France. Um, and they have you know, many years of, um, of experience in promoting this field of media and information literacy. We could call them grandparents of this particular co um, concept. No, this, this presentation that I was giving for UNESCO was I believe some eight years ago in 2013 it was. So now CLEM is about 38 years old. 
And in that presentation, I made some suggestion um, as to UNESCO's foresighting and how we can see the world in terms of social development, social and social development in the next 30 years. All right, uh, and looking at some of the, the social challenges, you know, what will be happening? Uh, the idea was to make a projection in connection with the 2030 agenda. So eight years ago, these discussions were being had that with this transformation in the digital sphere, that we're going to have different types of challenges with freedom of expression, especially online. And we're seeing that happening right now. We're seeing a decline in freedom of ex expression across the, the globe. Many studies, um, including um, the Pew's International Studies, studies that has been carried out by UNESCO, World Trends on Freedom of Expression, um, 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 Press Freedom House, and many other um, uh, um, uh, stakeholders who are doing these empirical studies are showing that um, there's a decline on freedom of expression. There's some complex reasons for that. You know, you see here where I suggested, um, especially on the internet, because we are also facing that challenge of freedom of expression on the internet, not so much from institutions and stakeholders, but from algorithms and the control and the power and the rising power and importance of digital platforms and algorithms and the threat that algorithms themselves can bear towards freedom of expression online. So eight years ago, we did not have this, again, this, you know, social media was around, but there wasn't this strong dependence, all right? So we see something that was being projected for 30 years has become, you know, is happening in less than 10 years. It's kind of like how technology is growing exp exponentially, um, you know, um, every, every, two, every two years. Now it's every year that technology is, is training, is changing. Um, you know, another projection was that more countries will have um, access to information laws is a part of the work that UNESCO is doing with the European Commission in Eastern Europe, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and many other countries in the region, and indeed across the world. And 10 years ago, we had, I don't know, I don't remember the number, it might have been less than 50 countries with access to information laws. Today, we have over 130 countries, 128 countries to be exact, around the world with access to information law. And th these have implications because what happens when more people have access to information? You know, we, 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 we like to say in UNESCO that access to information is necessary, but not sufficient to empower people globally, because then we need to go further. We need to equip them with the media and information literacy competencies so they can be more effective in dealing with issues of data um, that the, pre the pre previous speaker was talking about more even flow of cultures across borders with another projection. Don't know that the extent that this is happening, there is some mixed data um, on that, but then we see a lot of um, marginal cultures that have, have, have come to the fore globally. You know, we have, we have seen um, the film in industry from, from Nigeria. Um, we have seen the film industry from, from, um, from China, for example, Bollywood and Nollywood. Um, have, have, have become center stage. We see pop cultures like K-pop, you know, from, from Asia have become a part of the digital culture and the media culture and the entrepreneur and creative cultures that the previous spoke, speaker talked about. So a lot more of this will be happening in the coming, in the coming years. Cybersecurity will increasingly become a top priority was another projection that was made um, you know, by you know UNESCO in a presentation, you know, eight years ago, and we see that happening now. We see, um, you know, many countries are setting up these different cyber um, centers and looking at how they can treat with cyber crime, not only from the issues with disinformation and false and misleading content online, but actual crime that are committed. You know, um, phishing and stealing people's you know identity. These major challenges have become central and priority to nations um, around the world, and they have important implications. I'll go very quickly. Um, uh, less specialists in specific subject areas and more experts in multiple areas. You know, we see the tradition in the university, and we again thank the University of Sarajevo for inviting UNESCO in this presentation. Um, traditionally in the past, we see we get people to focus on a particular expertise, 
But we're going to see that with the convergence around the world, not just in technology, but convergence in discipline. And this is a part of what is driving the UNESCO framework for media and information uh, lit literacy is that convergence with the information, the media and the digital. And this is why we need this uh, umbrella uh, concept. But we're also going to need more um, persons who are generalists, you know, who are perhaps experts in multiple areas and not just in one area. Gender equality, another big problem connected to the sustainable uh, development goal. And when we look at what is happening with mis misogyny, um, online, that's hate online towards uh, women, attacks on women journalists. When we look at what is happening in the media in terms of um, uh, how women are represented in the media and their access in the media and their leadership in the media, very, very slow um, development is happening. And this was projected eight years ago. And this is continuing, co continuing despite the massive expansion in digital technology, we don't expect some changes but we see that there's still marginalization of women. If you take Wikipedia and look at most of the people who are contributing to Wikipedia, you'll find again that women are being marginalized. So this is the challenge that will be faced. More language will be in threat of extinction and fewer languages will be uh, dominating. I wish I had time to expand on all of these, but I don't want to go over time. So let me just um, move along. Less text on the internet and more video audio and images online. We see it happening. This was projected um, again, as I said, eight years ago, and it's happening. It's happening that we're moving towards less text. Websites are being transformed and the world in terms of our online presence, we somehow we're being driven into design, um, you know, thinking and design um, um, and perhaps, you know, what the previous speaker called system thinking. It's a little bit of system thinking and design thinking that was pushing us on a particular path and how do we you know take control of ourselves and our lives how do we enable people to do that as they are pushed with this design and system type thinking on social media this highway this flood is like we're on a flood of water if you can visualize with me and we are being moved along we need some competences to be able to address that because we cannot depend only on video, audio, an image, you know, um, media reading and deep reading, um, you know, supported by media and information literacy, still the pearl of great price. And I want to give you a little bit of an anecdote on, on this experience. I consider myself, you know, perhaps one of those sophisticated um, user of digital technology and the media and everything that that brings, you know, um, because of my expertise and what I've, you know, we, we, we have been doing in UNESCO and the work that I've been doing in UNESCO. But a couple of days ago, I was supposed to make a presentation to some young people and, um, you know, it was a social presentation. It wasn't something academic. And, um, you know, and then we're supposed to have some food to eat. And I was talking to my wife and said, okay, my wife, let's, we're going to prepare some food. I, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to take some food for these young people to go and eat. Then on Friday night, I was on the internet and I don't spend a lot of time on social media. I prefer to read. Uh, I do watch movies sometimes to relax, but I prefer to read. And, um, but I was on social media and I said, ah, let me just, I want my mind to be clear. I want nothing in my mind. And I, you know, I was just browsing the internet and, you know, talking about this less text you know, videos and images. And I was seeing all sorts of stuff, what my friends eat, what they didn't eat. And, you know, all sorts of stuff. I was just browsing. And before I knew it, 45 minutes had passed. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm wasting my time, what I'm doing here. But just before I stopped and got control of myself to start thinking, I came across a video. And the video that I came across was a video of a woman making um, chicken. She was cooking chicken. Well don't want to support stereotypes men can cook chicken too as i said i you know and i was going to prepare to cook um you know to for these young people and so i looked at the video and what was being presented was it was amazing it something clicked in not just my critical mind but also in my emotional um you know um mind all right something appealed to me when i looked at that chicken i thought this looks so good. I want to make this type of chicken also for these young people and I would like to eat it. So I'm going to do it. 
And I got off the video and I was so convinced. The video was like, I don't know, two minutes long, you know, because again, we're being pushed to shorter and shorter videos. You're being told, ah, five minutes is far too long for a video. It must be shorter. And so um, I, I came off the video, I watched it twice and I was convinced that ah, I will be doing this. And so I said to my wife next day, uh, um, you know, my wife, listen, you know, we're going to buy some more chicken. I want to make this chicken. I said, what are you talking about? I said, I saw this chicken online and, you know, it was so, it was so, done in such fashion. You know, they took the chicken and they marinated it and they wrap bacon around it and they, 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 they wrap, um, you know, um, what do you call it? Um, potato. You know, Irish potato around around the, the leg, and it was nicely done, and it was baked. And I, I want to do this, and my wife said to me, my husband, you cannot do that. It's going to be too complex for you to do. You don't have time. And I'm like, no, I watched the video. The video was very short. I can do it. It's very easy. It was two minutes. The video was like two minutes long. No, remember I said I'm a sophisticated user of the internet, but at that moment, somehow my critical thinking went. All right. And I, con I was convinced. I convinced my wife I will do it. And she said, you're on your own. And I tell you, the next evening we went to the shop, we bought, we bought and I started doing this thing. My wife didn't see the video because I couldn't find it <laughs> back to show her. And I searched and I couldn't find the video, but it was all in my head. And I tell you, when I started trying to make that chicken eight hours later, <laughs> eight hours later preparation before I got that chicken ready, literally eight hours, including the next morning, the night before and the next morning before the meeting with the young people. No, what I saw in two minutes video, I was convinced that I could do it, not realizing that I need to re reconnect with my critical thinking and do not be carried away with my emotional thinking. And so another aspect of what we're projecting is that we need more emotional lit literacy, social and an emotional literacy to be integrated with media and information literacy. Privacy is another big issue that we're facing today. We see the GDPR in the region, and what is happening um, with that, but we're projecting, and this is a projection that is being made that you know, in the next you know, 15, 20 years that privacy um, will only, we can only achieve privacy if we completely come off the grid. You know? And I think, um, and for those who do not understand what, what that means is to, you know, to completely disconnect from everything that is digital and electronic, including your ITV, you know, or your lamp that is that is connected via YouTube. That's the only way we can have privacy, and this is going to happen. Um, we heard from the previous speaker about data. We're projecting that data will become an official value point to store wealth like gold and, and all. It's happening already where many researchers are projecting that data is the new goal. Printed books will still be in demand, but much of that is going online in digital media. And it's okay to have digital books, we can still read online, but we need to be reading. Less time to verify information. Again, this was projected eight, eight years ago. What are we looking at? It's already happening, you know, with the flood of information, with the, the information highway. People do not have time to verify information. Um, you know, people will be learning a lot more through media and digital technology as they do in the classroom and going very rapidly. Social participation will peak and perhaps become increasingly difficult to manage um, a projection. And we see a lot of that happening as well. Expert systems, at the time I put in bracket this morning when I was reviewing this presentation, but at the time, you know, AI wasn't so popular and there wasn't so much talk about artificial uh, intelligence in, in my days of studying this particular field some 20 years ago. Um, yes, over 20 years ago, more than 20 years ago. My gosh, I'm not that young <laughs> anymore. Uh, we call them expert systems, you know. Um, you know, um, We call them expert systems. And so when I did this presentation eight, eight, eight years ago and talk about some of these issues um, for UNESCO, you know, we, I use the term expert systems, not artificial intelligence, but this morning, I change that because this is what they're being called you now, artificial intelligence and um, machine learning, that they will be driving the internet. And so this projection was made eight years ago. It's happening. We see um, the big rush over the past five years towards investment in AI by um, um, stakeholders at all levels of society, government, 
international development organizations like, like UNESCO and, and the rest of the United Nations, the European Commission, a big rush towards um, AI. Uh, and that there's going to be also people consulting AI more for different issues, including um, you know, more than cons cons consulting AI system more than they consult, con um, sorry, sorry, consult physical experts. Uh, this will be happening, and this was projected. It's, it's happening now. We see people depending a lot in terms of, um, especially in this COVID-19 crisis, this coronavirus, coronavirus pandemic, we're seeing people depending so much for online sources for information about their health. Now, the education system has to change to respond to these um, social and development challenges and opportunities that we're facing today and that will continue to evolve in the coming 15, uh, 20 years as we look towards the, the, the uh, 2030 Sustainable Development Goal agenda. The education system must change to respond to that. We need new competences, competences proposed by Henry Jenkins and the previous speaker spoke about those problem solving, networking, collaboration, uh, critical thinking, which is a part, part of what media and information literacy is. We, young people need to be able to trans, translate you know, content from one format from a radio format or a media format or an online platform format to a different format that will satisfy their needs, their social need in their families, in their communities, in their countries, in their regions and globe. Um, so these are some of the competences. Um, competences linked to what the new London group called multi uh, literacies, you know, this multimodal uh, aspect of life that I spoke about earlier with that image that you know um we 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 are in we're merging that virtual world that digital world that electronic world with the real world and so we need these multimodal competences that new london group talks about and and again wrapped up in media and information literacy we need education system must respond by ensuring that we have people who can train in different aspects of media and information literacy. Individuals who can guide and train in all aspects of media and information literacy. We should not focus only on persons who can deal with information and, and, and studies. And, and the previous speaker spoke about that too, that we don't need only algorithm literacy. You know, we cannot just have people who are versed in training on algorithm. We need to ensure that these people who have competences in training and algorithm also have competences on media and information literacy and inf the information side and the media side to critically analyze messages and information at a different level. All right. Um, voila. Okay. Um, let me just move very quickly. Media and information literacy, literacy should be, should drive, um, a new set of tools, all right, for information verification. And, you know, we, we need that creativity that the previous speaker talked about to get people to start developing new tools, you know, to help to drive information verification, new analytical and measuring tools for information and to assess the veracity of information. Media and information literacy should drive that in the education system. But not just the education system in general, uh, but media and information literacy also must, res must respond to cultural literacies. We must you know, see how the digital and electronic world is wrapped up in our cultures, our way of doing and thinking, our, 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 our systems of beliefs, our traditions, how the digital technologies and the design of digital technologies and media and electronic platforms are wrapped up in, in, in cultures. And so that these digital technologies are not valid neutral and they're not culture neutral. And so in moving forward in the, 20, in, in the next 15 years, we need to make a closer link between media and information literacy and cultural literacy. And UNESCO, we are doing just that to our inter, interdisciplinary approach or multidisciplinary approach um, with, our, with different um, sectors within UNESCO. As you know, UNESCO, we have different sectors, education, natural sciences, social sciences, culture, um, and communication and information. And so we're making that multi interdisciplinary um, link to how we train on media and information literacy. We need to ensure that the research side of media and information literacy and respond to those challenges and social and development challenges and opportunities that I mentioned earlier, that that research side of media and information literacy is not only the remit 
of academicians. And sometimes we think it's all about academicians, but common people need to understand the importance of research and information verification and critical thinking as they interact with all sorts of information and content online. Uh, we, need, we need, sorry, what is happening here? Yeah, so just um, just um, forgive me a little bit there. Yeah, so we, we need to push for media and information literacy to be part of the standard education system, all right? And uh, I mentioned this, this earlier, it, media and information literacy must be seen as a part of literacy, a part of, um, you know, building people's communication capacity a part of building people's reading and deep reading capacities, not just something for teachers uh, and other professionals, but all level of societies need to have these, these competencies. Media and information literacy should respond to the challenges by enabling citizens to demand more freedom of expression, freedom of information, um, to, to, to enable them to be drivers behind peace building and intercultural dialogue to, for, you, for people around the world to demand quality information, quality media, but more increasingly, more importantly in these days is the transparency of digital platform. Media and information literacy should drive that. We need national media and information literacy policies and standards. And we are happy that um, the University of Sarajevo um, through Professor Emir is, is, is pushing that agenda and a number of other stakeholders in the country and in the region to develop national media and information literacy policies and strategies. We need mail in the classroom, but we need it also outside of, of the classroom. We need that combination of um, a blended approach that UNESCO likes to, to, call, to call it. As mail responds to those challenges, mail will be and should be linked to issues of algorithm, algorithm literacy, transliteracy, and concepts like meta literacy. We have to rethink the widely referenced statement, all media are constructs. And I think most of us were familiar with the term, of course, media and digital platforms, digital media and traditional media, they do construct reality. Um, they, they do give a version of reality, but the connotation about behind media as construct has contributed to the declining freedom of expression. You know, it's has contributed to, yes, that decline in freedoms because people have started to attack the media, that this is not reality, <laughs> this is not real. And a lot of that is backfiring. Um, and there's some studies that have been done in that area. This, this sort of framing of media and information literacy um, as media media are being all bad. And we're, we're almost going to, be, we're, we're on the verge of making the same error where we're saying digital platforms are all bad that we need to protect people from them. And then when we do that, what we don't realize we're doing is that, as we say in English, we're throwing out the baby with the bath water. And so we need to rethink this concept of all media constructs because media, digital platforms are important for social life. They're important for democratic processes. They're important for sustainable development goals. Yes, there are challenges, but we have to balance both. We need to rethink um, um, concepts like the medium is the mes message. Um, famous Marshall McLuhan, which has formed the foundation of what we call media and information literacy. And he's one of the, again, the, the founding fathers of the concept that we use in UNESCO now, media and information literacy. The medium is the message. And again, there's some truth in this, but then we need to go beyond that in today's mediated world where we have a situation where citizens and users have become creators. And so we're talking about prosumers you know, and procreators, you know, in a different context of, 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 of the world, where ordinary people are not just consumers in the traditional communication, um, you know, um, Shannon model. They're not just receivers of information, but they're also creating um, through digital platform. And so the medium is not only the medium that is the message as we move into the next 15 years. People must realize that they are the message. What we create, what we prepare, and what we put out, we are becoming the message and we can make a change to what is happening. It's not only the responsibility of the digital platforms, but 
us as individual and every single individual over the 4 billion individuals who are online on sorry on the on the internet and also online on social media we need to make change in how what we create and what message that we are sending media and information literacy should build should be that bridge between learning in the classroom and learning outside of the classroom it is exactly what I, how I started out this UNESCO presentation with the virtual world and the real world and how we, do we make that bridge in terms of social learning, emotional learning and critical thinking through media and information literacy. This can be done and UNESCO, we're doing that. Now, why did I say all of that? I say all of that to come to this, as I said to you, this new resource that UNESCO developed it's on the left hand side of your screen um media and information literate citizens thinking critically clicking wisely um you know a very powerful um title um you know because this is what is going to drive people around the world and drive social life you know if people develop these critical um thinking uh, competences in terms of how they use information, access information, and engage with media, media and digital technology. Uh, some ten years ago, UNESCO had the vision, um, you know, to the vision of convergence is happening, and we need to bring together the notion of information literacy, digital literacy, and media literacy all separated. And that's when it started. It was long before 10 years ago. In fact, it started some 40 years ago that UNESCO had this vision, but it was over 10 years ago that we developed the first edition of this curriculum. And why did I share all of that? Because everything I shared just now is captured in this resource. And this is the power of this resource that UNESCO has developed. And we have not done it alone. We have done it with people like Professor Emir and, and, uh, and the, the previous speaker and st stakeholders and experts around the globe. When we developed the first edition, um, uh, you know, we had consultations in all regions of the world uh, to develop with experts in different disciplines, as I pointed out, so as not to repeat. And we did the same thing for this, this, this resource. It's a power house re resource. It's comprehensive, comprehensive. It includes all of what I spoke about and more. Um, and more importantly, it brings together many different disciplines and link media and information literacy to other social competences such as health literacy, cultural literacy, financial literacy, and other forms of uh, literacy. It's uh, I, as again, I, I keep repeating this point, it is all inclusive. It's an umbrella type of resources, which includes many of the competences that, um, you know, Marius, uh, the Mario or the previous speaker uh, spoke about. We do have other resources, the policy and strategy guidelines, uh, you know, which is, is, which is driving uh, the work that we're doing um, to push for national media and information literacy policies. And again, congratulations to Bosnia Herzegovina, um, the UNESCO antenna office that is there in Sarajevo, that is driving a lot of work um, on media and information literacy, because we know that this tool has been used by Bosnia Herzegovina under the leadership of Emir to adopt, to develop a sort of a national version, version of this uh, curriculum. And this is what UNESCO is driving for. We want countries around the world, and it's already happening, but too slowly, all right, but it's happening and we see a groundswell right now as attention is turned back to the urgency of media and information literacy to adapt and use this tool and to integrate it in formal education system, but also non-formal education system. Well, I've said this point um, that media and information literacy for UNESCO is an umbrella term and it covers all these different notions of literacy, privacy literacy, data literacy, games literacy, film literacy, and you can name it. You perhaps have some other literacies that are missing from this ecology. And you heard about systems literacy, which is not noted here, but it forms part and parcel of what we're calling media and information literacy. I want to just wrap up um, on the basis of this curriculum that UNESCO have, have um, developed is online. I encourage you to download it and to use it in all your work. Um, it's a work for capacity development, but it's also a tool for capacity development, but it's also a tool for research. 
Um, it's, it's a tool for creative research. It's a tool for innovation. And on the basis of, of, of that tool, UNESCO developed what we call the five laws of media and information uh, literacy. What are the basic principles that should drive these type of, 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 of concept? And I don't think I have time to go through all the five laws, but essentially the idea is that we should not see uh, digital technology as being more important than books or libraries for that matter, um, but they all have an important role to play in social life. The idea that all people, everyone is creating information and they, they do have messages, you know, whether they, they realize that they do or not, but they, you know, we, we all, we're all creating information. Um, the, the, the point that I made earlier, law three, that information and knowledge messages are not always value uh, neutral. All right, this, 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 a lot of what is being presented in this con 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 um, conference, this webinar, is perhaps not all value neutral. And so there needs to be critical thinking and um, uh, assessment. Law force that every citizen wants to know, wants to know and understand new information and knowledge, you know, even if they don't know this. But we have to respect their human rights. And law five, very importantly, media and information literacy cannot be. Uh, achieved at once. It's not a once-off competencies. You don't go to a course for one week or a 20-hour course in a university and then you're media information uh, literate. But it's a lived, it's a lived dynamic experience and process and we are all gradually becoming media and information uh, literate. And for, for us to develop any form of training, and, and, and the previous speaker mentioned this, any form of training on media and information literacy, we need to ensure that it's covering the issues of access, evaluation, assessment, critical thinking, use, production, and it involves not just digital technology, but information, media, books, and library. I'm coming to a close, um, a complementary resource that we have developed is called the Media and Information Literacy in Journalism, a handbook for journalists and journalism educators. And even though it talks about journalists and journalism education, it, it, it covers a lot on libraries. Um, in this in this resource and the idea is how can we get more and digital platforms as well how can we get more media organizations media institutions digital platform to integrate media and information literacy in their operations and policy and this resource um, is is helping that it's, it's kind of what we're calling media and information literacy by design linking back to the system um, thinking you know how can we create media and information literacy by design offline in traditional media and also to different um, stakeholders. We have developed assessment framework. You can see on the right of your screen, how do we measure media and information literacy and how do we assess country readiness? So comprehensive tools, but I want to end where we started on media and information literate. Citizens, think critically, click wisely. Again, a resource that is more than a resource, it's a way of thinking, it's a way of living, it's a way of researching, um, it's a way of innovating. This is what this resource is, 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 is all about. It's not only knowledge packed, but it's value, social value packed, all right? And uh, UNESCO, we believe that this resource will, will benefit many around the world as the previous edition benefited many institutions and organizations um, around the world. The previous edition existed in about 16 different languages. And I tell you only about six of those languages UNESCO paid for. 10 of those languages were translated by partners around the globe who came across the, 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 the resource and they were impressed by what was captured in it. And they contacted UNESCO and said, can we translate this free of cost for UNESCO? And we anticipate that the same will be happening to this resource though it is twice as large as it was before the first edition was over 200 pages. This is one is over 400 pages, but it's designed in a modular um, um, approach. The final statement I want to make and thank Professor Emir and University of Sarajevo for inviting UNESCO is that what, is what UNESCO is driving at in pushing for this framework of media and information literacy, this way of living and thinking and researching and innovating through this resource and through what we call media and information literacy is that it's not the mountain of information that we conquer. 
It is not the power of digital platforms. It's not the power of traditional media. Um, you know, as we, we in, in the past with communication theory, we talk about, you know, media being the magic bullet, you know, um, the all powerful media. And today we're getting, we're saying the all powerful technology. It, history repeats itself and we make the same errors, but then we make the same errors more than once and it's no longer an error. Huh? We're being, um, we're not being responsible. I, I, might, I might suggest, if I could suggest that when we're making the same error many times, something is wrong. And if we made the error and talk about the all powerful magic bullet um, of the traditional media and we're doing the same thing with digital technology, UNESCO is suggesting that it's not the powerful digital technology that we conquer. It is not the mountain of information that we conquer but ourselves, it is ourselves. If we empower ourselves, if we transform our minds, if we transform how we think, search for information, assess information, then we will have the control that we do have over information. We will have the control over what some call information overload. There's no information overload. We can control that flow, but we need the competences to do that. It's not the world. It's not the, sorry, the mountain of information we conquer. It's not the powerful digital technology we conquer, but it is ourselves. With that note, I stop here and I thank you very much for your time and, um, and for the, this meeting of minds. <laughs> thank you, Aldo. Dear Altam, thank you very much for your time and for your great presentation, but uh, most of all for putting Emir and me together uh, four years, five years ago. And actually, as you've been saying, it uh, somehow ignites us to and pushes us, motivates us to collaborate and work together uh, from different backgrounds, different uh, disciplines, different faculties. And from that uh, uh, time, we actually uh, 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 did a, a great work in terms of uh, uh, not just uh, uh, making uh, our own book and our own uh, 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 curriculum uh, based on UNESCO documents and uh, uh, UNESCO uh, 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 issues, but uh, 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 what I want to stress is actually that we really position the libraries and especially school libraries and school librarians as a hubs for media and information literacy, in, uh, at least in, in, in our strategy for Canton Sarai. So uh, uh, we are uh, 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 pointing and stressing out that uh, uh, interprofessional partnership between uh, school librarians and teachers is the, 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 the uh, is our focal point uh, uh, because we wanted to skip the uh, 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 um, uh, uh, false opportunity to have another. Uh, a, a subject in the school, which is not the uh, the, the answer for the uh, uh, for for our needs in media information uh, literacy, because the the, the competencies uh, uh, are for everybody, and for 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 to open the school to the to the. Uh, 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 digital environment, we all have to learn from each other and to uh, 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 actually foster the opportunities in a way that are sustainable and feasible. So uh, uh, I'm really glad that you uh, uh, found the time to be with us today and to uh, uh, hear you and see you after a long time, I would say, but uh, uh, hopefully we will be uh, 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 in, we will stay in touch, and, and uh, I would like to, to uh, uh, have you here again physically in Sarajevo as a few, uh, 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 a few years ago. So, uh, as Alton, Alton in, in uh, preparation for this conference promised he'll be coming soon, so <laughs> we'll, we'll take you for his words. Uh, the, the, I don't know how much time, Alton, you have, but uh, we are following on... Uh, uh, presentation of what we have done so far at the University of Sarajevo and uh, just just to point out uh, the, the several main points and maybe if you have time uh, we can discuss all together on, on, on this and uh, maybe to see what are the best ways forward um, uh, we have already uh, done um, a few days uh, of uh, extensive preparation, two months workshop on media information literacy, actually a curriculum uh, uh, with, the, with the librarians. And um, 
it's just a great opportunity to to be working on this. Uh, this is just two of us for the presentation sake. And the University of Sarajevo is the oldest and the largest public university in Bosnia and Herzegovina. But this process is very interesting. We kind of uh, push it uh, all the way through and kind of pushing the boundaries and envelope further to see what we need to do to to um, build uh, alliance and and to build the partnership synergy uh, within academic community, within professional community, with the stakeholders, um, extensive process of lobbying advocacy within the region as well. Um, and as that, uh, we, we came to uh, pretty much, uh, I mean, we are satisfied with the results, but the main thing is that uh, we kept to the, these uh, five key principles that uh, we want to make, uh, suggest only feasible solutions. Um, our key is sustainability, that uh, it's not about the project. I mean, we, we, uh, we're doing um, uh, uh, whenever we can something useful, but always towards the, the single goal of making feasible and su sustainable solution of introduction of media information literacy, dedicated to, to high policy implications. Uh, with a long-term commitment and put the, the libraries, uh, open classroom and interprofessional partnership um, in the center with the idea that media information literacy should be uh, uh, taught as cross-curriculum competence. Um, we have done pretty much a lot of the things and uh, uh, we have become uh, the, the hub and incubator for, for media information literacy, literacy development. A lot of the, the things has done and um, a lot of professors and experts uh, were involved uh, in what we are calling actually anti-disciplinary approach, approach that goes beyond uh, the interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary because we have put all the disciplines on the table without any boundaries. And then we got uh, these great results. Uh, uh, more than uh, 1,500 individuals were into the research and design process involved, and uh, the probably next next great thing will be the fusion of our hybrid model with uh, metal literacy and guided inquiry design and practice. And just after us, we have already waiting uh, uh, the, the 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 founding uh, uh, fathers of the metal literacy. Uh, as a keynote speakers, uh, which we are very happy to, to, to have today. Uh, we have put uh, uh, all this in a lot of uh, uh, written <laughs> words uh, to have this uh, kind of good theoretical and knowledge based, so we don't have to uh, put all the, all the teachers and, 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 and librarians we are addressing uh, into the unknown uh, waters. Um, and we have been writing uh, all this in, in, in languages that can be understood in uh, uh, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro. Uh, so basically uh, referring to the whole, whole region. Um, this is a complex uh, uh, kind of visualization of uh, our hybrid model of multi-stage integration, including digital dynamic learning objects, uh, guided inquiry design, open education resources, but most importantly, the horizontal and vertical integration uh, to, uh, where from, from uh, uh, pre-elementary education to the higher education, lifelong learning, um, all the process of media information literacy should be integrated as a, and also uh, the, the interprofessional partnership, uh, which is the key for, for the cross-curriculum uh, uh, development of, of media information literacy. We have put a lot of work in the research and development, so all this is well grounded and uh, uh, working with, with uh, uh, on policy changes because otherwise all this would be just uh, a, another project. And uh, we want to make this a movement, uh, a life uh, changing element and uh, uh, actually uh, intervention in society. Uh, especially in the educational uh, sector. Um, we have wrote, and you have been part of uh, some of our activities, beginning from background papers, policy papers, and uh, we came to the uh, one strategy in Canton Sarajevo, and 
basically we ask ourselves well, where is the future well it is what we make of it and uh, we see that with the joining all the forces uh in in today's just just today's conference and all all the work we have been doing all the people involved uh here are making these uh changes we are very proud of the massive online open course at university of Sarajevo, which we have uh put up uh and it's all been uh put to the use uh with our almost 40 librarians for all all over the country that passed this intensive uh course in media information literacy as the focal point and preparation for the next phase of entire classrooms uh, actually schools being integrated into the hybrid uh, model uh, it is actually university certified uh, that can be uh, run as the self-paced or summer or, or, or winter school but also in in class with the, the teacher providing different uh, ECTS points um, and it's actually with the, with the primary and secondary users um, we have covered with this tool massive online open course pretty much everybody massive online open course being primarily focused for the uh, those after the the, the secondary school uh, of age and through librarians and teachers in schools for pretty much all the all the younger ones zero plus till uh, till 18 and um, uh, we, of course it's we, we see it as a digital dynamic learning object it's something that we will be currently upgrading because both uh, professor Mario Hibbert and myself are teaching the courses on the first year first uh, me first semester he's in second one onto different faculties and kind of this this way continuously being exposed uh, to new generations and, and giving the, this feedback always to uh, improve this this tool um, we have as, as you mentioned uh, we have uh, developed uh, our own curriculum with uh, pretty much same ideas of what needs to be offered to the those uh, of uh, providing better understanding of media information literacy so the the accent was also on uh, digital transformation of society algorithms uh, artificial intelligence but also security uh, ethics and foremost we have ground this on human rights and democracy um, the model is well structured we tested it and it's working uh, excellently these are the, some of the, the the feedbacks we have uh, from from the learners that went through uh, uh, our MOOC and we are just amazed with uh, how good they, they, they see it um, uh, so the piloting process we have been doing in schools and we talked about this a few years back it's now like going with the with good vision of where we want to uh, be uh, it will take some time but uh, it's getting very well and uh, our dedication is towards monitoring evaluation and learning in, in, in media information literacy integration we want to see the impact we want to see what we are changing with the different uh, approaches and uh, uh, the different uh, kind of, of, of models to introduce and what I would like to everybody now to, to kind of uh, uh, help us see and understand what's the future of higher education uh, actually what's the future of education at all uh, we see it and possess, pos position it in our uh, writing uh, as closely cor correlated with the agenda 2030 of development goals and uh, not only for for a few of the goals but pretty much uh, our standing is that uh, inform educated and empowered by critical thinking citizens are the key for uh, implementation of all development goals uh, so anybody's thoughts here from the audience or uh, public in a, in a webinar Mario I know he's, he's I mean, we, keen, we, to, keen to continue we, uh, I, I, it won't be long uh, I, I would like to say that we usually 
finish uh, uh, our lectures uh, 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 with, uh, with saying that uh, media information literacy is not uh, 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 only about technology, it's not only about the content, it's not only about the media, it's not actually only about the digital skills, but about processes, approaches, attitudes, ethics and politics and community building. So uh, 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 I must say that uh, uh, what I learned uh, uh, through this uh, uh, process of uh, uh, thinking and rethinking how to integrate and uh, introduce uh, media information literacy in our uh, uh, education uh, it was really not just a great journey, but uh, it was really tempting to uh, uh, um, find uh, a way and approaches that would fit uh, 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 the best for uh, uh, our uh, local and I would say uh, a complex political uh, uh, context. So uh, uh, I'm really glad that we are uh, having this conference today with our uh, partners from uh, Germany, University of Hildersheim, who also recognized uh, our efforts. So we somehow joining uh, uh, forces uh, 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 all together and uh, uh, um, supporting each other in, 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 uh, for the future. And uh, uh, Alton, if you are still with us, uh, maybe you have some uh, uh, final comments. Yeah. Uh, Alton, you yes. just yes. Yes, I'm very much here. Thank you so much um, um, for for that um, presentation. And forgive me, um, you know, Professor Mario. Um, I, I know it's Hibbert, but I say Mario first name um, for you know for my lapse in memory. Indeed, we you know we we started many years ago with Professor Emir. Um, uh, you know, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and uh, that was, you know, kind of the foundation of a lot of what is, is happening uh, in, in the country uh, now. And um, for UNESCO, it is, it is quite uh, impressive. I, I mentioned earlier my colleagues in the uh, Sarajevo office uh, who were heavily involved um, in, in that initiative with the European Commission, and also my colleague, um, um, Boris Lab was in the in the UNESCO um, office there, but also my colleague Adeline um, Ull is in the Brussels office, you know. And um, you know, so from a, from a UNESCO standpoint, and uh, not speaking on behalf of the European Commission, but knowing the type of reports that we have, have shared with them, there's a really, <clears throat> you know, a good model that we're seeing in Bosnia Herzegovina. You know, um, you know, this is this is the vision, this is the approach uh, that that UNESCO wants to, to, to see and, um, you know, in terms of the localizing resources, um, you know, um, adapting those resources to the, 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 the local context. Earlier I spoke about the cultural realities and the social realities that are not all the same, you know, um, and, uh, and then, you know, with my little bit of knowledge about Sarajevo, when I visited, I'm sorry about Bosnia Herzegovina, when I visited and I recall both of you, um, Professor Emi and Professor Mario, telling me about the different cantons in, in Bosnia, Urgea government. Is that correct? You know, different yes. cantons and the different education systems and the complexity of how it all comes together. It's really this complex uh, system, you know, um, and, 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 and to be able to penetrate such a complex system with the models and programs and activities that you have been developed and both of you have been leading uh, not just at the institutional level, but involved in many other stakeholders um, the, at the government level as well as the academic level, that bridge between research, policy, and civil society. And I see you know, all that converging in the initiatives that you're doing in, in Bosnia or, 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 or Zagovina. And so UNESCO, we really say hats off to, to both of you for your leadership and all the networks and, and, and persons that you you are working with um, in the country and um, in the region. I just end on the point that you said just now, Professor Mario, that indeed media and information literacy, it's not just about um, you know, a set of thinking skills or critical thinking skills, but it's about attitudes, knowledge, attitudes, ethics, uh, value, a way of living. And uh, that's really a powerful note to end on. So thank you so much to both of you. And uh, I'll try to stay connected as much as I can to just hear from some of the other speakers. I see Professor Jacobson is connected. Um, you know, we have, you know, know each other quite well too. So I'll stay and see how, I, you know, we can, we'll continue 
the meeting of minds um, together so that we can create that melting pot yes. of knowledge. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Alton, a lot for joining us. And uh, yes, uh, the support from UNESCO, both from Paris and uh, local antenna office here was crucial for uh, uh, what we have been doing in, in past years. Um, as the agenda goes, we'll, we'll have a, a possibility to have a discussion now, and maybe some uh, short break before our uh, keynote uh, speakers, professors Tom McKay and Trudy Jacobson from Sunny Empire State uh, College, University of Albany, uh, on developing meta-literate learners to advance democratic ideals. Uh, we have incorporated their work uh, as, as one of a very important part of our um, curriculum and uh, the uh, approaches. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for, for joining us very early, actually, having in mind the time difference. Uh, so do we have uh, uh, any questions now? Uh, a lot of our colleagues from, from behind the scenes and cameras are working here tirelessly and thank them very much. Uh, so uh, I, I maybe missed questions. Do we have no? Uh, there was something on. Okay. Uh, Shall we make a short break before the keynote then? Then uh, yes, that will be probably the best best idea, and uh, we'll have in exactly 14 minutes uh, our dear colleagues uh, Jacobson and McKee to to for a key key presentation. Alton, thank you very much again for joining us, and I hope you can manage to, to stay along. Thank you all. See you in thank you. Thank 40 you. minutes. Okay. Thank you.
Gerald. Welcome back. It's uh, our great pleasure to uh, introduce our keynote speakers uh, from Sunny University, Empire State College and uh, University at Albany, Professor Thomas McKee and Professor Trudy Jacobson. Uh, do you hear us? Are you with us? Yeah. Great. Yes, thank you. Good morning. <laughs> this is a long day here in Sarajevo, but uh, I'm so uh, honored and so glad that uh, you are with us uh, today. And uh, uh, we are more than eager and happy to uh, hear your keynote. So uh, uh, I, I believe that we will have a time also for discussion after uh, uh, your, uh, your lecture. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mario. We are absolutely delighted to be with you, um, although we would have loved if it could have been in person. Um, we um, have been really enjoying um, the previous speakers and um, so many wonderful ideas. Um, my name is Trudy Jacobson. I am the head of the Information Literacy Department at the University at Albany, which is part of the SUNY system. Hi, and I'm Tom Mackey, Professor of Arts and Media at SUNY Empire State College. And as Trudy said, we, uh, we've enjoyed the conversation so far. And even though it is a little bit earlier here today, we woke up early just to see uh, uh, many, many of the presentations. So, um, yes. Uh, so um, this slide about democracy, um, the Greek origins of the term, um, and you will hear again about another term that we use quite frequently uh, that has, uh, again, origins from the Greek. But we've included this slide uh, to make connections with meta-literacy, um, which involves individuals working collaboratively with others, so the community or the Demos, um, and aims towards empowerment. On the right, you see the power of, of the people and Kratos. Um, so meta-literacy aligns with the aims of democracy and meta-literate individuals help to strengthen democracy. We'll be exploring meta-literacy more a bit later, but we do ask that you keep this relationship to democracy in mind when we do so. And Tom is going to sort of oversee this. Um, I am going to put this link into the chat. Um, let's see. So this is a chance for us to be interactive and ask you, uh, you know, what are your responsibilities in a democracy? And uh, Trudy is sharing the link. And uh, the QR code also works. So if you if you have access to, if you can see the screen, you can just uh, move your cell phone up to uh, the QR code. Um, and you'll see, um, uh, you can put in three words or phrases in response to that question. What are your responsibilities in a democracy? And as you do that, we'll check the responses to see uh, what everyone's thinking about this very important question. And um, I can check to see if we're getting any responses through. We'll give everyone time. And if you do have difficulty with the QR code or the link, um, if you go to menti.com, uh, you can type in that code as well. All right, so we're getting getting a few through here, Trudy. Yes. Um, transparency, be informed. So some of these are reflecting themes 
that we've been yeah. hearing this morning or today. Um, Vote. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Question everything. So the critical thinking aspect of it. And the civility, and this is something that uh, Alton was just speaking about, and um, the fact that there are sort of sort of unspoken rules um, online as well as in reality. Absolutely, and transparency. Um, I like this one too. Keep faith in dialogue. The importance of conversation and dialogue. Excellent responses. Yeah, Respect. These are, yeah, yeah. These are these are great and things that we can keep in mind as we proceed with our presentation. All right, so we'll go back to the slides, and you can everyone can see that still. Yes. All right. So um, we we often uh, we like to start with this slide to kind of frame this as well because it was such a visionary article by uh, Markham um, in 2002. Uh, and he really, I think, um, sort of uh, raised what some of the concerns were about information literacy at the time. And I think he, he really saw it into the future and uh, raised some important points in terms of where we are now and what some of the challenges have been. So in this article, Rethinking Information Literacy, he really said that um, at that time, uh, that it was too limited in scope, uh, too grounded in text, um, overly concerned with uh, basic skills. So this idea of a, a kind of central focus on skills development. Uh, and he, what he said in that article too, is that it just wasn't, didn't go far enough to encompass really the changes that he was seeing. So the, the changes that involved the visual, the interactive, uh, and even what Alton had mentioned about this, this cultural perspective that should be embedded into this as well. Uh, so that was really a visionary article um, that really kind of sets the stage for why information literacy needed to change and what, where we are in terms of trying to move this forward. Uh, the problem really was this idea of the, the skills-based approach to information literacy. And this, this slide, uh, this is from the uh, American Library Associ Association, uh, the information literacy competency standards at the time from the year 2000. And you can see, uh, how this really doesn't fully address the kinds of things that have been discussed so far in the conference. Um, really important uh, skills, clearly, but it doesn't go far enough. And models like this do also tend to get uh, very outdated, especially with developments in, in uh, technology. Um, in, our, in our new book uh, uh, that we, we just finished, uh, Learner, where we look at meta-literacy in a connected world and learners as producers, we really, try to dig a little bit deeper into some of these trends that have um, really placed a value on the learner as producer. And this, of course, is Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, it's not a literacy model so much, but it is a, uh, a model, uh, a classification system that's really a hierarchical system that, of course, is, is known worldwide. It's had incredible influence. Uh, and this is a really interesting visualization of the revised taxonomy that took place in 2001. Um, and uh, Vanderbilt University uh, created this uh, in 2010. And it just shows other models beyond the skills-based approach. Um, and it shows how building on a, a learner's knowledge in this hierarchical sense, so kind of a, a scaffolding of, of learning where uh, it really leads up to the learner as creator as producer of information. So uh, you can see from uh, remember, understand, apply, analyze, evaluate, all important considerations as well, leading up to uh, create. And another interesting aspect of uh, Bloom's taxonomy and the revision is that the original taxonomy really focused on the, the cognitive, the affective, and the behavioral but in 2001, the revision really introduced metacognition, uh, which was a recognition of the importance of reflective learning uh, as part of this process, which we'll be talking about as well. And of course, uh, Alton discussed this uh, so well in his presentation, um, the media and information literacy is another 
clearly important model that goes beyond that skills development. Um, and it is an umbrella term, as we heard earlier, uh, where media and information literacy encompasses all of these other literacy types that, uh, that encircle it. And it's interesting too, that we've watched the development of media and information literacy, the, the circles around this continue to, to change uh, as there are new developments. So now we're talking about um, not only visual literacy, uh, digital literacy, media literacy, but privacy literacy, data literacy, uh, and AI literacy. And UNESCO is doing great work in that area as well. Uh, when, we, when we envisioned the meta literacy framework, we did something similar where we were looking at the impact of related literacies. And our investigation was very really interested in not just the literacy types, but what are the common characteristics for uh, all, all literacies that could be embedded into a kind of overarching concept? And again, another interesting aspect here with media and information literacy is that it is looking at the uh, learning domains. And this visualization, I think, just uh, shows this really well, this idea that the, uh, it, a learner needs to encompass the attitudes, knowledge, and skills. So again, going beyond the skills to consider these other learning domains. And although metacognitive is not mentioned here explicitly, as, as part of the attitudes, there is there is an area focused on self-awareness, which of course does uh, include the metacognitive domain. So this is an important slide. You'll see later why it's important to meta-literacy because we found we've been investigating something similar in terms of the model that we've been develop developing. And we think there's some interesting alignment with uh, media and information literacy. So why uh, meta-literacy? Um, and earlier, Trudy mentioned sort of the Greek origins of democracy. Um, there is something about the, the meta prefix. Uh, it clearly focuses on metacognition, but there's also uh, interesting uh, Greek origins for that prefix, which also means um, after or beyond. So in many ways, we've built that, that idea of what is a meta literacy into, into this as well, that it really goes beyond skills development. It goes beyond literacy as, uh, as reading and writing, and it goes beyond information literacy as search, retrieval, and evaluation to think of the, the sort of broader skills that go beyond that, especially in a, a digital mediated world and a kind of social, social age that we currently live in. So for us, it really is about developing a meta-literacy mindset. Uh, our intention was to uh, challenge these skills-based approaches, promote effective participation in social media and online communities, and also support not just acquiring information, but producing and sharing knowledge in, a, in collaborative settings. So now we're gonna look at some of the, some of the core components of meta-literacy. And this is our visualization of, of meta-literacy. Um, and it really brings together these core components. So at the center is the meta-literate learner, the first ring outside of the meta-literate learner are the four domains. Uh, so we include the cognitive, the behavioral and the effective, but we also a strong focus on metacognition. Um, then we have another ring of the uh, characteristics. So civic minded, adaptable, open, productive, and then the learner roles. So we're going to go through all of these uh, step by step. That's an overall sort of emphasis, but let's, let's first start with the, the characteristics of the meta-literate learner. Uh, and many of these also align nicely with the, the learner roles that Trudy is going to talk about. Um, but being productive, uh, again, in many ways, these are sort of outcomes that we're trying to have the uh, meta-literate learner achieve. Um, so it really supports being creative, being informed, being an active producer of information and doing so collaboratively. Uh, being open, being open to new ideas, insights, um, really being open to other people and other cultures. Uh, and we, we really believe that this really fosters empathy within these social communities, uh, being adaptable, so that it's being adaptable to technologies, evolving technologies that are always changing, um, but looking at those technologies in a, in a critical way so, so that the learner understands how they work and understands the difference between open technologies and proprietary platforms. Um, and then also civic minded, which clearly has a, a nice alignment with uh, media and information literacy, that it really reinforces an individual's civic responsibility in the communities that they, that they are a part of. So this idea that uh, connectivity is not enough, 
It's really about the learner understanding their responsibilities in these social settings. Now, Trudy is going to talk about uh, the next aspect, the next core component. Hey, and these are the learner roles. And um, something that we have found with students um, that we've been teaching and others who have taught in a variety of different disciplines is that when students or when all of us sort of really think about what it is we're doing, um, considering what this role means and reflect how to take it on successfully, it really makes a major difference in um, fully engaging with a role. So you can see here, Tom mentioned briefly the roles with the integrated model. We have four of them highlighted here. So researcher, so one needs to be able to um, find out information. This is something that Alton mentioned earlier. Um, it was also something that Amir talked about with the library aspect of things. The participant. So we are all participating in um, creating information, sharing information. Um, so uh, we really need to think about how we participate in different communities. And there's that issue of in-person or online and the connections between them. The collaborator we can do so much online in collaboration with others as well as in person. And how does one do this um, successfully? And then there is the producer, which is something that we've been talking about and that um, showed up in other presentations this morning. Um, so all of these are really very important as well as others that I haven't mentioned here. And then there are the learning domains. And uh, we've been talking a bit about them. There's a little bit more information here about them. But very often, learning is focused on the cognitive and the behavioral on the right-hand side. But we really need to think about how um, it affects our emotions and the metacognitive, the reflection upon what it is we're learning, what we still need to learn, whether we're in a school setting or not. The last component are the goals and learning objectives. And what we have here are the four goals, each of which have a number of really, um, I think, illuminating learning objectives, but the evaluating content, but also considering one's own biases, um, engaging with information ethically and responsibly, producing and sharing information collabor in collaborative and participatory environments, something I just talked about in the roles, and then developing learning strategies to meet lifelong personal and professional goals. Again, this is not just something that stops when one graduates. We do have these uh, goals and learning objectives in a number of languages, and um, we're always looking for people who might be willing to translate into ones we don't have. So um, the students' reflections on meta literacy, we've included these because um, we really wanted to highlight some of the things that the students found to be uh, really illuminating for them, things they had not thought about. So for the first one, this is one of the learning domains and uh, a student in a course that I teach um, talks about the affective domain um, being really important. He talks about going from a helpless and clueless state of mind to motivated and a reassured state of mind. I did have another student who mentioned in one of her, um, these are all from um, reflections at the end of a course where they learned about meta literacy, that she had never thought about her feelings as a part of learning. And this was just a revelation to her and it really made a difference. So again, with what we're um, including in meta literacy, there's the um, dealing with information, but so much of it is focused on the learner and how they go about learning. So the students also have considered roles. And in this one, um, this student talked about um, helping him <clears throat> to work more productively. <clears throat> and with more intention. And uh, that was something that I had mentioned earlier with the roles. 
on this one here, uh, this student um, talks about there's no such thing as an idle role. Um, so the importance of interacting with information, you can't just be a consumer. It goes beyond that and the responsibilities that one has um, when dealing with information and how one shares it. And for the collaboration, um, this student uh, thought of himself as a collaborator. Um, he thought the importance of seeing many viewpoints and interpretations was critical. Um, earlier, um, Joachim um, talked about the course. And um, so the viewpoints, the cultural interpretations um, is something that is really critical. So moving on from some of our students' reflections to meta-literacy in practice. And we just wanted to give you some ideas of how this can be done um, in the context of a variety of different courses or even outside of it. So this publishing in Wikipedia, students in uh, one of my courses do do this. They've been learning about meta-literacy and information literacy in the course. But um, they really need to have it made visceral for them. They really have to engage with it. And so when they are creating content for Wikipedia, they need to think about themselves as a producer as well as a consumer. So that brings in the behavioral and the metacognitive they recognize that they're teaching others. So they are taking things that they have been learning in their classes and using research, they are bringing this to others. This can be a little bit scary to them. They have not been asked to do this before. So this brings in the affective, the behavioral, because they're actually creating this content and the cognitive. They have to think about what it is that they are including. And then another one from goal three, recognizing the diverse cultural values and norms to create and share this information for global audiences. They also do think about gender bias. This is something that um, Alton had mentioned earlier, and that often informs the topics that they pick. So I mentioned this role of teacher, and this is a quote from one of my um, most recent students. Um, and she said, she's never done this before. And the impact that this had on her was telling. So this is something a little bit different. Um, this is a module that is available um, online um, in a program called the um, I Succeed. It's a course for new college students. Uh, Tom and I and a colleague, Kelsey O'Brien at the University at Albany um, worked on the content for this that is available um, in a couple of proprietary versions from Lumen Learning um, and the SUNY sort of instance of that. But also you can see down below a URL for the content um, that's freely available. And so this would be something that could be used in a variety of instances. And Tom, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. About yeah, I, I think any of these, um, because th that link is openly available, uh, there's a nice focus on uh, the producer and collaborator role, which includes an emphasis on digital storytelling, which I'm going to be talking about uh, soon, but also uh, an, an entire part of this module about uh, being a digital citizen, which is something I think we're all interested in advancing. This is another open system that is available. Um, it started out as a badging system so that we could actually, um, uh, learners could show that they had gone through this. Our badging system broke down a little bit, but it is all available on a Google site. Um, the content is uh, divided in four areas, um, the producer and collaborator, Tom just mentioned, um, 
master evaluator, empowered learner, and digital citizen. And within each of these areas, there is um, a variety of uh, exercises, which we call quests um, and challenges. So it was built on a gaming model. Um, and this content can be adapted to any discipline. Um, so we have had, for example, a professor of political science at the University at Albany, who has really incorporated this and adapted this to what it is that she teaches in this course. Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, and throughout this process, uh, many of these resources that you're seeing, it's interesting because we've been developing the meta literacy framework. And from the very start, we've also been developing open resources so that we can share these ideas. And we've been doing so um, working together and working with the Meta Literacy Learning Collaborative. Um, as part of this, we've been developing MOOCs for quite some time. We developed a, originally a connectivist MOOC, um, and then we combined that with badging. Um, the two that are, are probably the easiest to access are available via Coursera. Um, so the first one, which would be a great introduction to Meta Literacy, it's a four week um, course uh, in Coursera called Empowering Yourself in a Connected World. So it takes you through these, these four main modules uh, so the students understand their roles in meta literate learner, uh, how to become sort of a meta literate dig digital citizen, uh, this process of creating and sharing information through digital storytelling, and also seeing yourself as a, as a producer of information. Um, the second one, um, which is the most recent that we've done, is really trying to um, look at this idea of the post-truth world through the lens of meta-literacy. So again, focusing on empowerment, how to be empowered in this kind of environment, understanding, uh, investigating what expertise means uh, in today's world, uh, how do we build trust online, uh, false representations in constructed media, being able to look critically at, at you know, deep fakes and, and uh, other kinds of images. Um, and then kind of trying to really focus in a positive way on, on the importance of raising and sharing our voices, again, being empowered, empowered and then also uh, working together to reinvent a truthful world. Uh, so again, open resources available there and you can use them as they are. Um, Digital storytelling is really much about students creating their own personal narratives um, with easily available resources online. So I've been teaching this, store, this course with my colleague, Dr. Sheila Aird, who's in Prague. She's our European program director in, stationed in Prague. And so we've been bringing students from the US and Prague together to create their own digital stories. And we've, as part of this, have really embedded information literacy into the entire course. So it starts with a selfie video where students not only introduce themselves, but talk about the learner roles they identify with the most. Uh, there's a midterm self-assessment where students investigate their own learning through the learning domains. Um, there's also a final project uh, that's, that has to be focused on a social cause. And as part of that, we also do a, a discussion where students have to investigate several questions related to the collaborator role. And there's a resource available via metaliteracy.org that actually uh, has a, a, that integrated model with questions that, that, are, that anyone could use. And then at the end of the course, there's a final self-assessment where, uh, again, they assess their own learning based on uh, the characteristics of the metaliterate learner. There is a resource. Uh, we have an, a, a, another blog, a digital storytelling blog, and also a virtual museum that has several examples. This is just one example. I, I don't have time to show it, but it's, it's a team of students working on this question of uh, clearly the pandemic has had, it had impact. And they talk about the impact of the pandemic on artists uh, in the art world. Um, and they offer many suggestions for supporting artists during the pandemic. And then just quickly, uh, this is an insight from a student who, who completed this course. And uh, there's a link here to her mobile story. But she has this really interesting insight about how, uh, you know, meta literacy is very much about the learner and their self reflection. But this is such a great um, insight because she talks about how the roles and the characteristics allowed her to better understand her peers, her, the other students in the course. So not only did it have an impact on her, but it gave her insights about the other learners in the class. 
So Trudy, did you want to talk about the additional resources sure. we have available? Yes. So um, we've talked about some of these. Um, we have a number of resources that are available on metaliteracy.org, uh, the learner figure, the characteristics, the roles, the objectives and domains. Um, and we have links um, to all of these others. And um, as we've been talking about them, they can be used in a variety of different contexts and courses and disciplines. Um, and they're also really good jumping off points. So um, something might give you an idea that um, might spark something that you um, would like to do. So we'll close with um, one uh, other survey. Um, and for this one, um, now that we've introduced you to meta literacy and you might already have some familiarity with it, um, what does meta literacy mean to you? So um, again, you'll have, Use, you can use the QR code, you can use the, the link that Trudy is putting into the uh, chat box, and then we'll take a look at uh, your responses uh, as well. So again, you'll have three, three words or phrases. What does meta literacy mean to you? And then we'll take a look at your responses and then we'll open it up for questions after we see, to, see what everyone has to say. And the one I just put in the chat code is not correct. Um, so I will get the correct one in there. And I'll check this in case anyone used the QR code. And another option would be to go to menti.com and you could use this uh, number here, 9040-9930, and that would also take you. Okay. And the correct one is now in the chat. Perfect. So this is interesting, different skills together. So it's sort of that integration of uh, skills and abilities. Uh, Ability to sub subtract, interesting. Collectivize curating. Oh, that's a really interesting term. And that shows the collaboration too. Right, right. It is interesting. The meta literacy model is very much with the, the learner at the center. Um, oh, here we go ability to understand, power to act, act absolutely. That's, that builds in the empowerment piece. Future of thinking. I really Training. like these. Different yeah, these are so yeah. interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Educational progress. Temptation, interesting. Training for future. Well, Learning in general, kind of a comprehensive model, recognition, ideal. And it could be, Tom, that when we um, sort of finish up and turn yeah. this over to discussion, some of this may come up. Right. So it doesn't look like we're getting new ones, so maybe we can open it up for discussion. So thank you very much. Yes, We'd love thank to hear you. any questions that you have. We kind of moved through that quickly, but any questions you have? Yes, thank yes. you, Tom and Trudy. It was a wonderful presentation and interactive one also. Uh, uh, we are really, uh, uh, let's say, became somehow fa fans of meta literacy, but we are still in the process of <clears throat> Uh, uh, understanding it actually, actually uh, uh, understanding how to use it as uh, instruction for the uh, school librarians, because we, uh, uh, in our strategy uh, for media and information literacy in Canton Sarajevo, we we work with school li libraries and we are uh, uh, trying to get to the point of. Uh, 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 mm, uh, 
building the, their competencies in terms of uh, uh, guided inquiry design and, and metal literacy. So what would you suggest, for example, how to approach, uh, 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 what would be the, the, the best way to, to uh, enhance them, their skills? And uh, uh, actually, do you have an experience working with, uh, with uh, not just librarians, but, uh, but the communities who wants to become metal literate learners? So I would like to, to, to hear some of your uh, uh, advices and comments on that. Um, well, we did do something a little bit unusual at one point, and we worked with some middle school students. I think maybe they were eighth graders. Um, and uh, by introducing some of the concepts of meta literacy, so often we'll... Um, hone it down to the roles and to the learning domains. And just as we found with um, university students that this sort of spoke to them, they had a project where they had to create something um, and uh, thinking about themselves as information producers and what they their responsibilities are, what they bring to this, and what their biases might be. Um, Mario, I don't know if this is exactly getting to your, um, your question, but um, for us, it was a very different group. And um, we found that this was something that was equally applicable. And it was interesting that that what they were doing was creating uh, public service announcements, um, I think related to the pandemic, unless they, because I know we did a section on uh, the infodemic, um, but maybe, maybe it wasn't limited. Maybe it wasn't limited to that. They could probably pick whatever they wanted now that I think about it, but it was a public service announcement. So it was a short um, video um, about about some kind of uh, cause where they wanted to convey information. It was a actually a rather sophisticated uh, exercise. Um, so, I, and I think that what we did was something you could do at sort of the college level, or this was a this was a younger group, and they responded really well to the ideas. And it's that's what one of the reasons we included the student reflections because there there's been such positive response from our students of having these uh, exercises where they get to think about their role. Um, a lot of times students don't see themselves necessarily as a producer of information. They might be using the technology, uploading videos and selfies and all that kind of thing, but don't see that as sort of producing knowledge uh, or, or they may not, even though they're doing this in a kind of connected space, may not be doing it collaboratively. Uh, and we know too that working with students, um, a lot of work has to go into preparing them to work collaboratively. So there's, a, there's so much there that has to be uh, taught. Um, I would, one other quick thing I'll say is that uh, I think a great starting point actually would be some of the resources we pointed to because there are questions that relate to all the core components we mentioned. And I think that they're, they're easily adaptable to different disciplines and educational levels and settings. Thank you. Uh, is there something like a curriculum of, uh, uh, in metal literacy? <clears throat> There, there isn't. We wanted to sort of keep it adaptable. Um, so we're finding different um, instructors that we work with are using different aspects of it. I mentioned the political science professor. She focuses a lot on the badging content and she has her students actually write quests and present them to the class. Um, I've worked with a first year experience instructor who um, we did a whole class period on um, the learning domains and roles, and then the students created collaboratively jam boards. Um, they were looking at ethical use of information there as well. So there's no real set curriculum, but um, I guess flexibility is um, what we've aimed for. And I think there are different models um, that might be adaptable. Um, I think the I think the MOOCs are helpful in that that way because it does show you kind of you know the arc of a of a course so how you could introduce students to the concept um, apply it to an issue like post truth world um, 
and then sort of lead to students really the pinnacle of being producers of information about that content. I think the module we showed kind of shows a framework for um, how you could use this. Um, in, the, in the new book, I actually um, write about uh, how I, um, I teach a course where I link it to the, the MOOC, the post-truth MOOC that we created, but that might not be practical for everyone. So ultimately the argument we make in that chapter is that um, it's probably better to take these adaptable resources to link to the videos instead of like a whole MOOC to link to videos, to diagrams, the figures, the interactive figures that we've developed um, and really apply it to your own setting. And the badging system, that yeah. content actually does address virtually all of the goals and learning objectives um, using scenarios and such, but I don't know if I would call it a curriculum per se. Right, we've tried to keep it really open. Great, thank you. Uh, we, we have a question yeah. um, from our colleague Jelko Blatze. Uh, the question goes, uh, how much is uh, meta literacy an advocacy for sustainable media comments against corporate own social media? I, I don't think we've approached it in quite that way. I think what we're um, trying to do is have learners, all of us, citizens, think about how we interact as individuals with others on social media um, and um, sort of the empowerment, but empowerment with responsibility. And I, th I think that the probably the closest um, approach to so those kinds of questions really take place in the post-truth MOOC um, because we, we ended up doing this um, as we were developing that MOOC, we ended up, we were having these really interesting conversations about the difference between the promise of the connected world, which we really clearly em embraced originally, um, and then sort of how that, that promise of all things are possible in this democratic space and everyone has a voice. And then we contrasted that to, you know, again, around this time period of 2016, where really this kind of emergence of a post-truth world, questions about that. And in, as part of that, there is some critique of uh, proprietary social media and trying to make students more aware of those spaces and everything that goes along with it, that it's really not free, that there's advertising and there's data that's being collected um, and trying to raise that awareness. I think there's even more that we could do with that. Um, and I think the, the work that UNESCO is doing that there with some of the recent um, resources they've, they've been developing for uh, AI uh, might be a nice sort of alignment. Um, so it is, and I think also the, the adaptable characteristic is very much about adapting to new technologies that are always evolving while also asking really critical questions about them. Thank you. Any any questions from 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 our library, or any other questions uh, uh, from online world, from physical or virtual spaces, <laughs> metaverse, will do. Thomas, maybe. So I guess there are no any other questions. So I uh, like to thank you again for being with us and sharing your. Uh, thoughts and uh, 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 <clears throat> ideas on how to become a meta-literate learner. Uh, I, I must confess that uh, I really enjoy uh, uh, also working the, the, uh, with you in, in another project uh, with the University of Hildersheim. Now we have a, a <clears throat> professor from Hildersheim here in, here in Sarajevo. Hopefully you will be our guests uh, 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 in, in the near future. So uh, thank you again for, 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 uh, for <clears throat> uh, being with us and uh, greetings from Sarajevo. Yes. Thank hope, you. To see thank you. You. hope to see you here soon. Oh, we would love that. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank uh, you. We're so honored to be here and we've really enjoyed the, the day. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, that conversation is wonderful.
Thank you for facilitating that. Thank you Thank so you. much. And maybe we can now go, Thomas, for closing remarks. I have some very quick closing remarks. Thank you all for one. the wonderful organization here, uh, Mario and Emir. That was really good. And all the people in the behind the scenes, behind the cameras, everything worked so smoothly. Thanks for the speakers and so on. And I think uh, we have seen a lot of concepts. And one of the concepts that was always uh, becomes more stronger is the connected world, uh, we see this network literacy, let's call it, that came up in, in several talks. And uh, I think uh, we are doing this, as Mario now pointed out, in kind of, <laughs> yeah, and I think we really have to thank for bringing us together and for bringing many in the room here together. A great thanks to Tatiana aparec Jelusic, because <coughs> she's really a, a tireless networker and connector within the region and to outside. Srečko knows what I'm talking about. And uh, uh, many of us would have not probably gotten together in projects without her tireless efforts. Thank you so much. Thank you. Pro probably one of the few things that history didn't find out that she was uh, the one that invented the term connection in the first place and then implemented it throughout the world. And thank you very much again. So, uh, with this, uh, I will kindly uh, have the, 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 this pleasure to thank you all for being with us here today in the Library of Faculty of Political Sciences, University of Sarajevo, and in the Connected World Metaverse, joining us uh, from all continents. It has been a great uh, two days, great pleasure of working with the University of Hildesheim again, and. Thank you all the people that you have seen and those who you haven't seen be working tirelessly behind the scenes and uh, making this happen. Uh, hope to see you soon in Edessa uh, 2022. Um, again, with even a better lineup if that could be possible, but we'll try our best. Thank you very much and uh, uh, we are kind of closing this from uh, the University of Sarajevo. Thank you.